welcome to my compilation video of every cut change and addition that was made to the first core of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc anime adaptation. Manga fans have been eagerly waiting for the anime for over 10 years, hoping that we would get additional scenes which shine a light onto specific moments that were either rushed or overlooked within the manga. Now this video compiles together all of my episode comparisons for the first core of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. Hopefully you can better understand how the anime is adapting the manga through the various different cuts, changes and additions that they are making. So without further delay, let's dive into the first core of Bleach's all new anime. Episode 1 roughly adapts 5 chapters worth of material spanning from chapters 480 to 484 into the 20 minutes of the first episode. Interestingly, there appears to be more cut content than additions during this first episode of material. We of course start the episode with an anime exclusive scene of Yuhabak quoting the Quincy's Emperor song. Now this is then followed by the first three pages of chapter 480. This straight one-to-one -one adapts the Soul Society's Research and Development Institute reacting to a large number of hollows suddenly disappearing. Now these events that are adapted into the anime are not really changed much from the manga, but things do begin to slightly change following this scene. The conversation between Kuromadani, Ryonosuke and Shino actually takes place in the Soul Society within the manga, but in the anime it is repurposed and the talking points are included upon their arrival in Karakura Town. Now this is a pretty minor change and it's probably done to help with the flow of the episode. Additionally, the interaction between Kuromadani and Ryonosuke at the start of chapter 480 is cut from the episode, where he falls asleep while listening to the briefing from Kuromadani. Also, there are some gags that have been removed during the interaction between Shino and Ryunosuke, like in the manga where she tells him to puff out his chest with confidence, and he laughs saying that she doesn't have much of a chest. Again, this is another minor inconsequential removal. After the two of them split up in the manga, Ryunosuke is immediately confronted by a hollow, but in the anime we see him patrol Karakura Town and we get to appreciate some really stunning visuals of the area until he rests at a bridge where he is then approached by the hollow. When Ryunosuke eventually finds Shino captured by the hollows, it is a bit more bloody in the anime, as we get an exclusive shot of her dropping her blood-covered Zombakdo. Chapter 480 ends with Ichigo arriving to protect the Shinigami, but in the anime we are only 5 minutes in and Ichigo is accompanied with his friends who are revealed here, and each of them gets some extended time for introductions as they all showcase their abilities while fending off the large number of hollows. Now this moment of the episode incorporates elements from a flashback in chapter 481, when Ryonosuke recalls Ichigo and the others arriving to help him, and most notably Orihime healing him and Shino. Again, for the sake of pacing, the flashback is removed and we get to see an extended scene of Ichigo and the others fighting the hollows. Quite notably, in the anime, Ichigo activates his bankai here and performs a Getsuga Tensho, which I believe is an anime exclusive scene included purely for fan service, and it works incredibly well as we are reintroduced to the world of Bleach and its main cast. At the end of chapter 480, we see someone who resembles Iben eavesdropping around the corner of a building, watching Ichigo and the others, but this is removed from the anime. Now, one of the biggest cuts from this episode is a scene from the start of chapter 481, where we catch up with the Vizards who appear to be walking home from the bathhouse. It's a short two-page interaction between Hiyori and Lisa that ends with Hiyori noticing a mysterious hole opening up from the corner of her eye. I never really was able to pinpoint what this hole was. Is it a foreshadowing of Yuhobak's Almighty being activated? Or was it caused by Iben unleashing the hollow bait? Or is it residue left behind from Iben disappearing into the shadows after he was eavesdropping? It is strange that this was removed, but for the context of this video, we just cut straight back to Ichigo's room where Ryonosuke has just woken up and Orihime enters with her leftover bread. Now this is all straight up adapted from the manga, aside from Ryonosuke's flashback which was included in the extended hollow fight that we saw earlier. In the manga, we briefly cut to Ika Kaku and Yumichika rushing to investigate the disappearances in Rukongai. But in the anime, we straight up have Iben's introduction, which brings us to the end of chapter 481. Chapter 482 continues with Iben getting kicked out of the window, and I have to say I love how this panel was done in the manga, with Orihime's facial expression being visible while she holds open the window for Ichigo in comparison to the anime, where we don't really get to see her face. The anime cuts a small panel that we have in the manga here, where Yuzu Akarin quickly react to 
to a sound coming from Ichigo's room as they comment on him horsing around again. Again, it's another inconsequential comedic moment that doesn't really affect the plot, but it would have been nice to have just as comedic relief. And another similar instance that is cut from the anime is when Ichigo says that he will deal with Iben and Chad and Uryu joke around and say that they will join him after they have eaten their bread. During Ichigo's confrontation with Iben within the manga after he says that he isn't interested in who Iben is and he leads them away to a safer location, within the anime on the other hand they stay put and talk while Ichigo asks if he is in Aranka. In the manga Ichigo even asks him if he is here to take revenge for what he had done to Aizen, but this line is omitted within the anime. We then cut away to Rukongai where Ikaku and Yumichika are investigating and the panel that was cut from chapter 481 is included here where Ikaku talks about the district where the disappearances have occurred which is under their jurisdiction. Now this I believe is another change that was made to help with the pacing of the episode I presume. We then segue into the first division barracks where we see an anime exclusive scene where the head captain briefly comments on Sasakibe fighting an intruder while on the other hand in the anime he is just listening to a report from one of the Shinigami when the Sternritters arrive and take out the individual. In the anime, it actually shows the Shinigami having been beheaded, but in the manga, it doesn't really show it as clear. But in the anime, this isn't really depicted. After the Sternritters declare war upon the Soul Society, this takes us to the end of chapter 482. The anime does change up a lot of the pacing here as we see Yamamoto's encounter with the Sternritter until they leave. Now, while Yamamoto is speaking to Sasakibe about something that the Quincy can do to their Bankai, we cut back and forth to Ichigo battle with Iben, where he attempts to steal his Bankai. The anime changes up the pacing here so that it emphasizes Sasakibe's final words and how they match up with Ichigo activating his Bankai and Iben attempting to steal it. The manga on the other hand shows us Ichigo's battle against Iben well before Sasakibe is even shown to have been impaled and pinned to the walls of the first division barracks by the Quincy Javelin. Now I do like how this was handled within the anime and it just makes the entire scene feel more impactful than it already is. Now the battle against Iben was covered entirely in chapter 483, while the Sternritter's discussion with Yamamoto takes place during chapter 484. Like I had mentioned earlier, Yamamoto speaking to Sasakibe is synced up to Iben using his medallion to steal Ichigo's Bankai. The anime does of course bring its A-game by ensuring that the visuals are absolutely stunning during this moment, especially during the scene where the Bankai starts to break up on Ichigo's arm. The final scene of episode 1 where we cut to the Quincy Fortress Silburn takes place at the end of of chapter 484. The only real difference between this and the anime is the increase in gore within the anime, where Yuhobak cuts off the arm of the Aranka and it's on the ground covered in a pool of blood, with Yuhobak stating that he dislikes conflict. Now this is just the final minor change in comparison to the anime and manga as we reach the end of the first episode which matches up to the end of chapter 484. Now in summary, a lot of the changes in the anime were done to remove any gags and to change up the sequence of events for the sake of pacing, and in general the only only big omission was the scene involving Hiyori and Lisa. I am not entirely sure as to why this was removed, but it could have been a change that was requested by Kubo, but we will have to wait to see if this is added to episode 2. Understandably, this is an anime adaptation, so it's not going to animate the manga like for like, and I actually enjoyed some of the changes that were done here. There was nothing that affected the flow of the plot, and in general it felt more impactful if anything. I loved how the 5 chapters were adapted into the 20 minute span of this episode. I do hope that we continue at this pace while slowing down only for moments that require expanding or elaboration, especially during those battles that occurred off screen. The second episode, which will air next week, will begin Ichigo's journey to Huecomundo, and I suspect the Quincy's first invasion of the Soul Society will also be included, so it's an episode that you definitely do not want to miss. The second episode of the anime adapts chapters 485 to 488. Now this is roughly 4 chapters worth of material. In this video, I will be going over every change made between the anime and the manga, as well as discussing additions, changes and cuts, while avoiding talking about any moments which are just straight one-to-one -one adaptations from the manga. So join me as we compare the second episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc to the four chapters of the manga that it adapts. Episode 2 actually has some notable additions, but like last time it has some cut content, and this time around a specific scene was cut from the anime which I'm not too pleased about. Additionally, there are some indications that the anime is rushing through some of the material within the manga. Now let's begin by comparing these 
start of the episode to the beginning of chapter 485. Before the anime begins, it shows us a moment from the beginning of chapter 485, after Ludas has his arm severed and he is struggling to sit up. We see a bit more of the gruesomeness of this scene within the anime, as we see the severed arm beside Ludas. Additionally, we see the title of the episode, Foundation Stones, on Ludas' severed arm before we cut into the opening of the anime. After the opening, the episode begins with a one-to-one -one adaptation from the manga. Things begin to alter when Ryunosuke his phone begins to ring. In the manga, he apologizes for the ringtone because it is a recording of Shino humming. Shino doesn't seem to be too pleased about this as she asks when he had recorded her. He then points out a very specific portion of the humming ringtone that he really likes in order to further embarrass Shino. Now this is another comedic moment that is cut from the anime, and following the trend of episode 1, the anime is focusing on serious moments in order to keep the tone of the series feeling consistent. Within the manga, Ryunosuke answers the phone after Shino hits him, while in the anime he just picks up the phone after Ichigo returns from his battle with Iben. The phone call is handled a little differently within the manga, as the call starts with Ryunosuke stating that there will be a funeral for the lieutenant of the 1st division, who has just been killed. However, the anime cuts this entirely, as it skips to Akon's debrief. The anime reveals Sasakibe's death impactfully towards the end of the call. Additionally, we get some anime exclusive scenes of Shino or Ryunosuke reacting to the news, with Shino stating that a man like Sasakibe has been killed as he was powerful enough to serve under the head captain for years. Now I feel like a later cutscene that I will speak about has been repurposed into this line read by Shino here. We also get some anime exclusive shots of Ichigo and the gang reacting to the news as they look really saddened to hear about the death of Sasakibe, while Akon wraps up his briefing. Then in the manga, we see Ichigo sitting on his bed before he decides to patrol Karakura Town. However, in the anime, we get a close-up shot of Ichigo staring out of the window with some sad music, setting the tone for the tragic news of Sasakibe's passing. Additionally, we get an exclusive shot of Chad jogging, as well as Orihime staring out of a window, and Uryu looking at his Quincy cross. Now, Ichigo thinking back to Uryu's comments from earlier while he is patrolling within Karakura Town is cut from the anime. Uryu speaks about how he feels optimistic that they are told an ordinary Shinigami like Ryunosuke so much information because they had known that he was with Ichigo. Now this means that they had wanted Ichigo to know about what is going on and that the Soul Society will call on his help in the not too distant future. Uryu also says that there is not much that they can do now, especially after Ichigo had told Ryunosuke the details about his battle against Iben. Now by cutting this scene from the anime, it seems like it robs some of the context behind Ichigo feeling a little lost here. Now in the manga, we understand why he feels helpless because of this moment that he thinks back to. However, in the anime, he just seems upset after hearing the news about Sasakibe and he just heads out to patrol the area. Chapter 485 ends with the reveal that Yuhabak has captured Haribel, and the anime adapts this exactly like how it was portrayed within the manga, and this takes us up to the 8 minute mark of episode 2. Chapter 486 begins with Ichigo questioning Nell about Hueco Mundo, until Peshe also arrives. In the manga, after Ichigo correctly identifies Peshe, he says that he was listening to Nell talk about how Huecomundo was in danger until he was rudely interrupted by him. Peshe then loudly agrees with Ichigo as he affirms everything that he has just said by saying that they have got Huecomundo, to which Ichigo says that he already knows this. Now this comedic but pretty pointless scene is removed from the anime, and it is yet again a moment that doesn't really affect the plot or the flow of the story. On the other hand, the following scene that is cut from chapter 486 is actually one that does affect the plot and really left me feeling confused as to why they would remove it from the anime. Now this scene occurs during the cremation ceremony of Sasakibe. In the anime, we see the Gotei 13 gather to pay their respects for the late lieutenant of the 1st division. Now despite the fact that this scene does feel sped up, it beautifully adapts a panel from the manga of Sasakibe kneeling before Yamamoto, but it doesn't provide the context for this scene, which can only be found within the manga, where we learn about the bond between the head captain and his lieutenant. We just see Yamamoto looking saddened as he says, light the flames. And it cuts to Yuzu lighting the gas hob in the kitchen. Now I just feel like 
like this is such a strange and disrespectful transition. I had genuinely laughed out loud when I had seen this because it had caught me so off guard. The manga on the other hand had Byakuya deliver a brief monologue to Renji and consequently to us about the kind of man that Sasakibe was. Since he got such little screen time and without this we would know very little about him, we learned that he was a Shinigami who should have been a captain. But according to the written records of the Soul Society, Sasakibe had attained Bankai before even Ukitake and Shunsui were born. However, not once did Sasakibe use his Bankai in all of the years that he had it. Now this is going as far back as the formation of the Gotei 13. Over time, some captains were reported to have insulted Sasakibe, referring to him as an assistant captain who doesn't take part in battle, saying that he is not fit to be a lieutenant. But despite this criticism, Sasakibe had never hated being the lieutenant of Yamamoto. He had even refused to be an interim captain after Gin, Tozen and Aizen had betrayed the Soul Society. We know that these positions were filled by Hisagi and Kira respectfully until the return of Kensei and Rose. This was because he was incredibly loyal to the head captain. He had sworn to be head captain Yamamoto's lieutenant for as long as he had lived. He was a man who had used his Bankai for the first time in battle and he had ended up dying. Byaki states that the grief that Yamamoto must be feeling right now is beyond the imagination of subordinates who have yet to endure such pain. Now this funeral within the manga was made so impactful because of the exposition that was delivered by Byakuya. It is easily some of my favourite pieces of dialogue delivered by him and it was such a shame to have this cut from the anime. It is by far the biggest cut from the anime so far and I really hope that they include this scene in one of the upcoming episodes and I hope that I am speaking too soon by saying saying that they had left it out for no reason. Now to help us forget about this omission, we get a pretty amazing anime exclusive scene where Peshe explains how the Quincy had taken over Hueco Mundo and Yuhobak had defeated Haribel. We cut to a flashback of Hueco Mundo with the corpses of Arankars littering the ground with the blue Quincy flames everywhere. Lightning strikes as we see Yuhobak in the sky charging up his Reishi. Now this is one of my highlights of this episode because I had wanted to see the Quincy's invasion of Hueco Mundo for so long and now we finally get to see it. We get a very brief glimpse of Harry Bell in a resurrection having been pinned to a wall just about to receive the finishing attack. Her final words are to Nell, Peshe and Dondachaka as she tells them to escape. Now while they run away we see Harry Bell transported by Yuhobak's shadow into the Quincy fortress Sealburn. When Peshe explains that the Quincy have captured several Aranka already, in the manga we see Ichigo think to himself that Iben must have been one of the recruits. This scene is cut from the anime. We then get an anime exclusive scene here of Peshe pleading with Ichigo to help them save Hueco Mundo. This is followed by another anime exclusive scene of Ichigo saying that they cannot ignore their request for help. While in the manga it just cuts to Uryu saying that he cannot accompany them this time round. In the anime we get an exclusive scene of Uryu saying that he cannot go with them because he is a Quincy and he can't help Hollows or Arankars. Now this added scene helps to provide more context for Ichigo assuming that the reason for Uryu not helping is because Quincy's exist to eliminate Hollows. Now in the manga this was a bit vague but thankfully the anime elaborates upon this. In the anime Uryu tells Ichigo to be careful as Ichigo tells him not to worry but Uryu is then cut from finishing his next sentence which appears to be another anime exclusive line as he was about to say something about the enemy. Now during the manga we see Ichigo tease Uryu as he tells him not to worry and that they will be fine without him. Now this is before Urahara arrives. Now the halfway mark of the episode takes us perfectly up to the end of chapter 486 where we see Hashward examining Eben's medallion. But this is another scene from the anime that is cut here where Hashward explains how Eben was unable to capture Ichigo's Bankai. In the manga Yuhobak explains how special measures need to be used against Ichigo, as Hashward agrees that it is nice to at least have it verified that their medallions don't work in Ichigo. Now this is another strange omission from the anime, as we cut to the start of chapter 487, with Ichigo and the gang travelling through the Garganta making their way towards Hueco Mundo. Now I hope that this scene has just been rearranged and it will be included within the next episode. Now before Ichigo and company break into Hueco Mundo, we get an anime exclusive scene of the Quincy leading away Arankars that they have 
held captive. After arriving and taking cover, we get an anime exclusive scene of Ichigo asking whether if Dondachaka is amongst the captives, but Pache tells Ichigo that he doesn't sense a spiritual pressure. In the manga, we see Ichigo covering the faces of Nell and Pache, which leads to a little comedic moment between Ichigo and Pache, which is removed from the anime, as he is seen to only be covering Nell's face within the anime. We then have another anime exclusive scene of the corpses of the Arankars being shown to us, whereas in the manga it is just spoken about. Within the anime, Kilgir's introduction is switched up here a little bit. In the manga, we cut to it immediately, but in the anime we see his men rounding up the Arankars before he is formally introduced. Within the anime, when Kilgir demonstrates what will happen to the Arankars who do not understand his orders, we see him violently impale one Arankar after the other. Now in the manga, we just hear him speaking, but it isn't shown in such graphic detail as it is within the anime. After Kilgir is confronted by Loli and Monoli, he comments on how he had thought that he had confiscated the Arankar Zambokdo within the manga, but his men try to answer, but this is cut from the anime. Moving on to the introduction of the three beasts, this is altered within the anime as the scene of them arguing is cut. The manga sees Mila Rose and Apache arguing with each other, meanwhile Sonson ends up confronting Kilge. We then cut to Ichigo rushing to the battlefield as he sees an explosion erupt from Haribal's fraction as they begin their counterattack against the Quincy. Now after Nell suddenly appears on Ichigo's head, a brief comedic scene is cut within the anime, where Nell tells Ichigo that she will always watch his back and stop him from getting hurt. Now the anime instead skips to the explanation of the three beasts. After Nell covers Ichigo's eyes and he begins shouting out, a scene is cut from the anime where Orihime warns Ichigo not to make so much noise because the enemy will notice them. The anime cuts another scene here of Sunsun questioning how long Apache and Mila Rose will plan on arguing while she eliminates some Quincy. Within the anime, this is restructured slightly as she instead attempts to blindside Kilge. Now the entire structure of this encounter is altered because of these changes, as a scene involving one of Kilge's men requesting to surrender is also cut. In this particular cutscene, we see the Quincy exclaim that the three beasts are too strong, as he requests that Kilge gives them an order to withdraw, but in Instead, he ends up killing the frightened Quincy. Kilge makes an offer to Harry Bell's Frashion to surrender while he is avoiding Sunsun's attacks within the anime, but in the manga we see him standing still speaking to them. Following this, there is an anime exclusive scene of Mila Rose jumping in the air attempting to attack Kilge after his offer of surrender. Now during this moment, the anime ends up cutting a panel where we see Kilge praising the three beasts, as he describes them as spectacular strong ladies who are perfect pawns for Yuhobak, and it is for this reason why he is not going to kill them, instead he urges for them to surrender. Moving on to the captain's meeting towards the end of the episode, Mayuri's speech is altered slightly here, so that he is revealed that the enemy of Quincy is timed for the end of the episode. So some of the information that he relays here is switched up, as he explains that the disappearance of a large number of hollows has caused an imbalance of souls, which would eventually spell the end of the human world as well as the soul society. Now this information is all anime exclusive, as we then cut away from the captain's meeting to Ichigo rushing over to the battlefield as he witnesses the three beasts being defeated and laying bloodied on the ground. As Mayuri goes back to the manga script and he syncs up the reveal that the enemy are Quincy to Ichigo finally confronting Kilge, which perfectly ends episode 2. Now the two notable omissions during this episode were Byakya's speech and Hashwad not elaborating upon Iben's medallion being able to seal Ichigo's Bankai. Additionally, we had several comedic moments that were removed and some scenes that had to be reworked, but surprisingly we had some strange additional scenes which helped to set the mood of some of the moments. We had more shots involving Ichigo and the gang, as well as the incredible anime only scene revealing the invasion of Hueco Mundo and the capture of Tia Haribel. We knew in advance that episode 1 would adapt 5 chapters and episode 2 would adapt 4 chapters thanks to the preview screenings of the episodes that were held in Japan back in September. However, as for next week, we are not really sure about how they will pace the episodes. I hope that they will include the information that they cut about Sasakibe in the next episode and how we will get to hear about Ichigo's Bankai being an exception to the norm. Now this is all very key information that really has me concerned about some of the cuts that they are making. Now while I express my concern, I'm still super pleased by the additional scenes here, and I can understand why they would remove some comedic moments that would disrupt the flow of the anime. These jokes probably work better in the medium of manga, but were served to be very disruptive if adapted straight into the anime. 
the third episode of the Thousand Year Blood War arc covers material from chapters 489 to 494, which is roughly six chapters worth of material. Like before, there is a lot of changes made to the way that the sequence of events unfold within the anime, as well as several scenes in the manga being straight up cut from the anime. Lastly, there were some notable additions made to the episode via some anime only scenes involving Uryu and Ryuken. Now, in this video, I will be going over every change that was made between the anime and the manga, discussing additions and cuts while avoiding any moments that are just one to one adaptations from the manga. So, join me as we compare episode 3 March of the Star Cross to the six chapters of the Bleach manga that it adapts. Now, the third episode begins by continuing the confrontation between Kilge and Ichigo, as most of this material is taken straight out of chapter 489. We also backtrack and see some footage adapted from chapter 488 from the captain's meeting, where Yamamoto orders the captains to prepare for war. Now, the anime is rearranging the order of some events for the sake of pacing, as well as for added dramatic effect. Episode 2 had ended with Mairi revealing that the enemy are Quincy, which is taken from chapter 488, and is then followed by Yamamoto sharing his thoughts. But the animation staff had decided to save Yamamoto's thoughts for the start of episode 3, so that we begin the episode in an impactful manner. Now, during the two introductory scenes of the episode, there is an anime-only scene involving Shunsui, as he comments on the enemy being Quincy, as he states that they are in a tough situation and that he had assumed that the enemy were Quincy from the get-go. Now, before the fighting scenes between Kilge and Ichigo taken from chapter 489 take place, there was actually a gathering of lieutenants at the start of this chapter, which is cut from the anime. We see Rukia frantically pacing as she waits for the captain's meeting to be over, as Renji reassures her by telling her to relax. Kira interrupts them as he speaks about how the disappearance of Hollows, the rebel army invading the Soul Society, and the disappearances within Rukongai are all linked to one event. He is then able to deduce along with the other lieutenants that the disappearances within Rukongai were in fact caused by the Shinigami and not the Quincy. And somehow Mayuri is involved and is keeping something from them. Now this scene involving the gathering of lieutenants lasts for five pages and it is completely cut from the anime. Now, this may be because there's a lot of speculative talk taking place here, and a lot of the information during this exchange is confirmed by Mayuri during his conversation with Yamamoto later on in the episode. Now, the following pages of chapter 489 covering Ichigo's battle against Kilge are adapted into the intro of episode 3. Chapter 489 continues by showing us a scene where Yuhobak learns that Ichigo is fighting Kilge within Hueco Mundo, and he orders the Wandan Reich to begin their invasion of the Soul Society. Society. Now, in the anime, this scene is rearranged and then actually is shown after Kilge activates his holy form. Additionally, after Yuhobak learns that Ichigo is fighting within Hueco Mundo, a scene is cut within the anime where Yuhobak comments on Ichigo being preoccupied with Kilge and that there is no better time than now to invade the Soul Society. Additionally, the conversation between Mayuri and Yamamoto that takes place at the end of chapter 489 is moved to a later point in the episode, after Kajomaru finishes speaking to Shino and Ryunosuke. The conversation between them appears to be extended also, as it begins with Yamamoto asking if Mayuri knows why he has been called here, whereas in the manga they are already talking before we cut to them. After he asks him why he didn't get permission before he had killed the 28,000 residents of Rukongai, we get some anime only dialogue, as Mayuri explains the consequences of not having acted quickly after a large number of hollows were eliminated by the Quincy. He goes on to say that the sacrifices of some citizens within Rukongai is not that big of a loss if it had helped to stabilize the balance of the worlds. The scene at the start of chapter 490 is placed later on in the episode, and it takes place immediately after Yuhobak decides to begin the invasion on the Soul Society. Now, after some chopping and changing of events, we return to Ichigo vs. Kilge and the portions of their fight from chapter 490 that take place immediately after the anime opening. The scene where Kilge is informed by Yuhobak to take out Ichigo is removed from the anime. Within the manga, we see a close-up shot of Kilge's ear where an earpiece is providing him with intel and updates. But because the scene where Yuhobak learns about Ichigo being within Hueco Mundo is reorganized, this scene no longer makes sense. So instead, Kilge goes on to activate his Quincy holy form. Ichigo says an additional anime-only line here where he thinks that Kilge has just used Let's Steal 
which is a transformation that Uryu had used in the past. Towards the end of chapter 490, the scene with Urahara running with Peshe and Donnachaka is actually moved to later on in the episode, and this is because Urahara senses that the Quincy have began their invasion of the Soul Society. They had put this at the end of the episode and altered the sequence of events again so that the episode ends on a dramatic note. Chapter 490 ends as we see Yuhabak's foot appearing above the Soul Society. This is also cut from the anime, as it's replaced in favour of showing Yuhabak's full body over the Soul Society towards the end of the episode. Orihime's comments at the start of chapter 491 about not feeling a Reishi shockwave after Kilge activates his holy form is actually cut from the episode. Additionally, Ichigo's two-page internal monologue in chapter 491 about Uryu's let steal form is cut. Now, during these two pages, he compares Kilge's holy form to Uryu's let steal form. He even recalls what Urahara had told him about the let steal, and this is cut from the anime too. When Kilge uses his ability God's Justice and he begins to gather Reishi from the surroundings, a scene where Chad comments on this is cut from the anime, along with an internal monologue by Orihime that follows Chad's comments where she now understands why she didn't feel a Reishi shockwave after Kilge had activated his holy form. At the start of chapter 492, Aeon looking back at the three beasts is cut, where they comment on him being worried about them. Instead, the anime cuts to Aeon screaming and charging towards Kilge. Before Aeon charges, Apache tells Ichigo and the others that they are not his enemies, so they better get out of the way if they don't want to get hurt, since the towering beast is unpredictable. Now this brief moment is also cut from the anime. We then get an anime exclusive scene of Uryu at his father's library within their home. He is looking through the books trying to learn about any Anything that would help him to explain what is going on at the moment. Ryuken finds Uryu and tells him that he isn't allowed in here without his permission, but he explains to his father that the Soul Society and Hueco Mundo have been invaded by the Quincy. Additionally, he tells him that there shouldn't be any other Quincy aside from themselves, as he asks if he had known about their existence. But Ryuken dismisses Uryu by telling him that it has nothing to do with him. Uryu says that as the last Quincy, he has a right to know about who these other Quincy are, but Ryuken does give him a hint that that the answer that he is looking for cannot be found within this library. We then cut to the Soul Society as we see Shino and Ryunosuke, but a comedic scene of them getting lost is cut from the anime. Another brief comedic moment is cut after Ryunosuke asks his question about why the Shinigami and Quincy are fighting, despite them having the same goal of eliminating Hollows. The cut scene involves Shino scolding him, telling him that they are fighting because the Quincy had declared war on the Soul Society. The introduction of the 6th seat of the 13th division Kajomaru is also altered. In the manga, he overhears that conversation and says that the rumours about the Shinigami Academy not teaching their students about the Quincy is true. Some of this exchange is rearranged and reworded, and I'm guessing that it's for the sake of pacing and in general streamlining their conversation within the anime. In the middle of Kajomaru's explanation, we cut back to Uryu during an anime-only scene where he notes that there is not much written text on the history of the Quincy. But then after remembering his master Soken Ishida, he enters his father's office where he finds a book. Now this book had belonged to Soken Ishida and presumably it has the Quincy history within it. While he is reading, Kajamaru continues his dialogue about the Quincy and Shinigami failing to reach an agreement, and then the Shinigami being given the order to eliminate the Quincy about 200 years ago via the Quincy extermination operation. While Kajamaru is speaking, we cut back and forth to Uryu while he is reading the book, giving some great context and added meaning behind Uryu learning the true history of the Quincy. Now, returning to Hueco Mundo, a scene where Chad is commenting on Aeon smashing Kilge repeatedly on the ground is cut. He says that Aeon is doing too much and that he is completely out of control. Now, quite a bit of chapter 493 is cut and changed around within the episode. In the manga, when Kilge first uses his absolute subordination of Reishi technique, he absorbs Aeon and transforms into a large form, taking up some of Aeon's characteristics. The three beasts end up running away from him and they hide with Orihime and Chad. And this entire section of them hiding is cut from the anime. In particular, this iconic panel where Kilge finds them and he uses the technique again to absorb the reishi of the three beasts and Orihime and Chad. The anime, on the other hand, has Kilge use the technique to absorb Aeon, and then he uses it again after having transformed to absorb the other's reishi, as it totally skips past the hide-and-seek section of chapter 493. 
Now, the final anime-only scene involving Uryu and his father in this episode occurs right before the end of the episode, as Ryuken sees him in his office and scolds him again for entering without his permission. Uryu asks if the things written within his grandfather's book are true. If they are then, Ryuken had known about the Wandenreich, Yuhabak, and he had even known about how his mother had died. Yet again, Ryuken ends up dismissing him and he tells him that it has nothing to do with him. This of course angers Uryu, who is left with no choice but to leave. A scene at the end of chapter 4 493 is altered within the anime. After Kajomaru reassures Shino and Ryunosuke that the enemy will enter through the gates, an explosion ends up erupting in the anime. But in the manga, we get some commentary from Yuhobak who appears above them alerting the 13th division squad members to his presence. Now this is all cut from the anime and instead several pillars of light erupt across the Serete as Yuhobak states that conflicts are painful. The events of chapter 494 are quickly adapted into the last couple of minutes of the episode as they impactfully reveal the Quincy having launched their attack against the Soul Society. A scene involving Rukia rushing to the Pillars of Light is cut here. Most likely it will be included in the next episode. Additionally, the scene involving the third seated officer who kneels before Yamamoto ends up having no dialogue within the anime. And I'm assuming that they will flesh out these moments that they have glanced over at the end of this episode in the next one, as they had really wanted to end this episode on an impactful note. As these stern riddles are revealed and the iconic scene where Kira is pretty much killed is shown to us. They cut a lot of the dialogue out of this chapter in general and specifically during the scene where Kira is speaking to the 3rd, 5th and 6th seated officers of the 3rd division as they talk about the enemy being within the pillars of light. The attack begins as the stern ritters are revealed and they are ordered to kill all Shinigami. As the episode concludes with Hashward appearing as he declares that the purge of the Shinigami has now begun. Now this brings us to the end of episode 3 as yet again we have another episode with several changes made to the order of events and how they occur, with some comedic scenes being cut and some scenes that disrupt the flow of the fighting that are not needed for the plot also being cut. Now the most notable addition that was made were scenes that had involved Uryu and his father, which I'm pretty happy to see. I love how Kajamaro's monologue was blended into Uryu reading his grandfather's book, and overall this was yet again another solid episode, and one that has me looking forward to seeing if Uryu's role will be expanded upon, since he is getting so much more screen time in the early portions of this story arc in comparison to the manga. Now I think from next week the pacing will actually slow down since the anime will really be diving deep into the fight scenes, which we were all promised would be expanded upon within the anime. I cannot wait to see how they will add to the highly anticipated fights between the different captains and the Sternritters. Where to begin, as the fourth episode of the Thousand Year Blood War arc adapts material from chapters 495 to 499, spanning a total of five chapters. There were changes made to the sequence of events and how they had unfolded within the anime in comparison to the manga, as well as several scenes that were cut for the sake of pacing and to avoid two characters repeating the same line but in different ways. I believe that this approach that the anime staff are going with ensures that this new anime remains to be all killer and no filler, and it focuses on adapting everything but the unnecessary moments so that they can include longer fights and faster pacing where it is needed. Now the fourth episode begins with a two or so minute recap, going over the events of episodes one to three, and we don't really get to see any new material until after the opening song. Episode four starts by adapting the final page of chapter 494, which was left off of the last episode, where the Soul Society's Research and Development Institute analyze and give a briefing on all of the casualties and destruction that has been inflicted across the Soul Society. Now during this very panic-filled briefing, at the start of the episode, there is an additional line about how they are confused about how the enemy were able to bypass the barrier of the Serete. The next scene is of Hashward confronting the 13th division, and this particular moment is actually changed around and it is taken from chapter 496, but it is placed early on in the episode before the captains are actually shown to have been confronted by the Sternritters. This change was done so that the defeat of Kojomaru could be used as an impactful start to the episode, as his blood spent spells out the title card of this week's episode, Kill the Shadow. Also, the anime actually adds this added visual of Kojimaru actually being split into two, confirming that the Wish.com Aizen is in fact dead. The material from chapter 495 begins at six minutes into the episode, as we don't really get to hear the report from the Hell Butterfly that was informing Rose of the current situation. Now in the manga, we actually get to read about what Rose learns here, as he is told about 27 Shinigami being 
being killed and that his third, fifth and sixth seated officer, including his Lieutenant Kira, have all had their spiritual pressures vanish. Now Kira's spiritual pressure having disappeared is the most important piece of information here but it does end up being conveyed to us later. The anime on the other hand chooses to actually show us the butterfly appear near Rose, but he just says that he understands and the hell butterfly vanishes. Now this omission doesn't seem to affect the story because Rose does in fact speak about Kira and about how he will not be pleased if anything has happened to him just moments later. So it seems like this hell butterfly monologue was cut because Rose speaks about how he would react if anything were to happen to Kira anyway. So this change was done for the sake of pacing, and so that the same point would not be repeated twice. When Renji clashes with Asnod, some lines of internal monologue are cut from the anime, where he questions why his attacks are not doing any damage, and he wonders if it's because of some unique ability or an ability that all Quincy can use. Following this, Mask the Masculine attempts to attack Renji, and another internal monologue is cut from the anime here, as Renji thinks to himself that Mask is fast after he evades his first attack and he is about to be grabbed by him. After Byakuya arrives and he speaks to Renji at the end of chapter 495, one line of dialogue is cut from the anime, where he tells Renji not to show the Quincy any pity. Following this, we get an anime exclusive scene of Mayuri in his private study room, as he comments that the Quincy don't just seal Bankai after he runs a test and it turns out to be negative. Now you can assume that he had tested Sasakibe's Zanbakdo for traces of Bankai, but it had come back as negative, leading Mayuri to deduce that they can steal Bankai. This is an additional scene that is not found within the manga, as it is revealed later that they can steal Bankai and not just simply seal them, with the four captains that had their Bankai stolen. Now a panel from the beginning of chapter 496, where Byakuya tells Renji not to show the enemy pity is removed from the anime, and this is following the removal of the pity line at the end of chapter 495. In the manga, Byakuya explains to Renji that the enemy had murdered Sasakibe, and they had shed blood within the Serite without any warning. There is no need to go easy on them or to show them pity. Renji does respond by saying that he wasn't showing them pity, so it kind of makes this scene pretty redundant. But I'd always interpreted this conversation as Byakuya sensing Renji's fear, as he was coming to Asnot's power. That is, until Byakuya had arrived, thus explaining why he was taken aback here, and why it may have seemed to Byakuya that Renji was going easy on the enemy. Also, he had just been protected from an attack by Mask the Masculine, and additionally, he was confused as to why his attacks were not penetrating the enemy's defences. So there were plenty of reasons for Renji to be flustered, and for the anime to kind of have this dialogue between Byakuya and Renji about him going easy on the enemy or showing them pity. Following the scene where Asnot's arm is cut, there is a scene removed involving Mask the Masculine, where he questions how Asnot could have allowed himself to be hurt through his blute vein. After the scene where Mask falls into the ground, we get an extended fight sequence between Byakuya and Asnot. They exchange blows in this anime anime only scene. We have similar scenes involving Komomura, Hitsugaya and even briefly Soifon, as they all showcase their Shikai against the enemy, as the anime shows us that the captains need to use their Bankai in order to hurt their opponents or to even have a chance of breaking through their defences. There are some visually stunning scenes here, like Asnod defending himself by using Blutveen on his eyeball, as well as Bambietta kicking a Reishi ball towards Komomura, and Hitsugaya struggling against Kangdu. We get just just under two minutes of extended fighting here, before we cut back to the manga material from chapter 496, where Byakuya is about to activate his Bankai. Now, the scene where Byakuya decides to activate his Bankai is handled differently in the anime in comparison to the manga. The manga stylistically cuts through each of the four captains, all delivering a monologue about why it is necessary for them to use their Bankai now, as opposed to the anime which cuts this segment down and only has Byakuya really speaking as even Komomura's lines are given to Byakuya and Soifon and Hitsugaya's lines are actually cut. Also, he ends his monologue by telling Renji that if his Bankai is sealed, then he is to use his own Bankai to defeat the enemy. In the manga, Byakuya actually begins the monologue with this line, in comparison to the anime where it's the last thing that he says before activating his Bankai. Now this is another example of streamlining material for the sake of pacing and avoiding a one-to-one -one adaptation of all of the scenes that are in the manga. After Byakuya activates his Bankai, it is completely animated and showcased to us properly with some stunning anime-only visuals, while the other captain's Bankai are just simply released and we get to see them via a single image. 
The anime also does an excellent job of actually showcasing all of the captain's bankais being stolen. We get some stunning anime only visuals where all of the bankai are broken apart and absorbed by the Quincy's medallions. After their bankai is stolen, we hit the end of chapter 496 and we reach the midway point of the episode. In the manga, after Yamamoto learns the information from Rangiku's Tentekura in chapter 497, he actually ends up rushing off to the battlefield. But in the anime, he stays put and does nothing choosing to look on with a somber expression with the dramatic music playing in the background. A scene from chapter 497 where the 13th division reacts to Hashwa defeating Kajamaru is actually cut from the anime. And this also includes the following scene, where Hashward asks Yuhobak what he wants him to do with the surviving Shinigami, and Yuhobak tells him to do as he pleases. The start of chapter 498, there is about three pages of material that is cut from the anime, and it's all in relation to the Research and Development Institute learning about Ichigo's whereabouts and that he is with Urahara. They are deduced that he doesn't have his Shinigami badge with him, and that it is in Urahara's shop, as Akon assumes that Ichigo is in Huekomundo with Urahara. Urahara. Now while this does provide some context, but for the sake of pacing, I do understand why this was cut from the anime. While Akon is speaking to Urahara, he loses his cool, and a scene from the manga of Akon's subordinates commenting on him losing his cool is removed from the anime. One of them says that only Mayuri and Urahara have this ability to annoy Akon this much. After Akon learns that Ichigo is battling a Quincy within Hueco Mundo, Akon's internal monologue is cut from the anime. The scene has Akon shocked to learn that the Quincy were in Hueco Mundo, as he wonders how Ichigo was able to realize and deal with them before even the Research and Development Institute had found out. Additionally, after this, Akon asks Urahara how Ichigo is faring against the Quincy, to which Urahara reveals that he is winning. Now this is also cut from the anime because it isn't really needed, because the following scenes of them fighting, it is made clear that Ichigo is whooping Kilge's ass. Some comedic dialogue from Urahara is cut from their conversation, as Urahara says not to be silly and that it can't just walk in into the middle of their fight and get Ichigo's attention. Additionally, Peshe and Dondachaka are seen to comment on Urahara's relaxed demeanor while he is on the phone. Again, this is another comedic moment cut to maintain the serious tone of the series. In the manga, Kilge states that he had received data about not letting Ichigo use Bankai, because his Bankai cannot be stolen, but he is frustrated because this is all that it should have been. Now this thought from Kilge is removed from the anime, as it's just a nice piece of context, but it isn't really necessary for the scene. Kilge's internal monologue from the end of chapter 498 is also cut, as he admits that he is struggling to keep up with Ichigo's speed, and that he has to keep his defensive blute active, while not being given adequate time to activate his offensive blute because of Ichigo's agility and constant attacking pressure. Now this omitted scene is inconsequential, as we learn about Kilge's predicament via Urahara when he breaks down everything that he has learned about the Quincy during his discussion with Akon and Ichigo later on while Ichigo is travelling through the Senkai on. Two pages of Ichigo's discussion with Akon in chapter 499 are removed in the anime. Instead, it begins with Ichigo learning that the enemy can steal Bankai instead of him being updated about the casualties, the Sternritters being captain class or stronger, and Ichigo being reassured that Renji and Rukia are safe. When Urahara explains to Ichigo the three pieces of information about the Quincy in the manga, he goes into detail with each of them. But in the anime, the information about the Quincy holy form is cut, and he only really goes into a little detail about the Quincy's technique Blute, and he briefly mentions its flaws while not giving an example of how he was able to take out Kilge because of this flaw like he does in the manga. Urahara's conversation is also cut short in the anime after he tells Ichigo that they cannot steal his Bankai and he is about to actually explain the reason for this, but then Kilge appears. Now, this happens very differently in the manga, as he actually says that he can't say for certain why Ichigo's Bankai cannot be stolen, but he knows that the enemy had only attacked the Soul Society because they were aware that Ichigo was in Huekomundo. This whole dialogue where Urahara tells Ichigo that the Quincy are cautious of Ichigo is cut from the anime, including Urahara saying that he will be joining Ichigo in the Soul Society shortly. The anime, on the other hand, just has has Kilge reappear, seal the Senkai Mon, attack Chad Orihime and Urahara while trapping Ichigo in a cage. With Ichigo trapped within Kilge's prison and the Bankai stolen of the four captains, we have
have reached the end of episode 4 of the anime. We are actually beginning to understand the direction of this adaptation of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, as not everything is being adapted and the moments that are cut are stated elsewhere, or that they were not important for the progression of the plot in the first place, so that's why they weren't included. Now, I love the two minutes of anime only fighting, where we got to see the captains briefly use their shikai against the Sternritters. It was so satisfying to see Byakuya actually land a hit against Asnot. So, overall, we had about five chapters of material adapted into this episode, and I definitely think that this was the best episode that we have had thus far. I love the pacing, music, voice acting, animation, and of course, there were some incredible visuals throughout. There were some scenes where I had goosebumps, in particular, when Hitsugaya had yelled out his Zanpakuto's name and the captains had reacted to the Bankai being stolen. It was all done very flawlessly, in my opinion. The fifth episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc is titled Wrath as a Lightning. This episode was really impressive and it had featured a lot of moments that were adapted straight out of the manga. All at the same time, they had cut some scenes out of the story, as well as including some anime exclusive moments, which served to excellently pad out the overall story of Bleach's final arc. This episode adapts material from chapters 500 to 505, which spans a total of six chapters, which covered the 20 minute span of this episode. Now, as with all of these manga versus anime comparison videos, there's a lot to dive into, so let's begin by discussing what is adapted before the opening song of the anime. Episode 5 begins with the Soul Society's Research and Development Institute relaying to the captains and lieutenants that Ichigo is on his way. However, the anime cuts out a panel at the start of chapter 500, where some messenger Shinigami states that sending a lengthy message to the captains and lieutenants while they are in combat is currently impossible. So instead, they have placed messaging swords onto the battlefield. The anime, on the other hand, chooses to just show the swords being placed across the different battlefields fields without this spoken context. Because of this, a scene from the manga is cut where Robert Accutron actually takes out one of the messenger Shinigami. There are several captains and lieutenants that react to the news that Ichigo is on his way, but the anime ends up cutting the reaction of Ryunosuke. When we cut back to the Research and Development Institute, we have a brief anime-only line said by one of the Shinigami, who states that when Ichigo arrives onto the battlefield, the tide of the battle will turn. Now this line is said before Akon starts to talk about how Ichigo's spiritual pressure has disappeared from within the Garganta. Now, there are some changes made here to speed up the pacing and to remove some unnecessary padding. As in the anime, things begin to unfold differently here. As Ichigo's call with Akon ends up being disconnected, and Akon says that Ichigo isn't responding. And just as they begin to investigate what on earth is going on, Jidambo breaks into the facility, and we see the foot of the person who is responsible for controlling the oversized Shinigami. We also get this very brief anime-only clip where manga readers will know which Sternritter is actually controlling Jidambo, as it's revealed to be Pepe, through this glimpse that we see of his staff. We then cut to a scene of Ichigo trying to break free of the prison, and then reacting to the screams and explosions over the phone. The anime cuts and changes things here. Firstly, Ichigo's call to Akon was disconnected as he had to dial back within the anime. But within the manga, Ichigo can hear Akon and the others throughout this whole encounter, but they are unable to hear him, as he frantically tries to tell them that he is imprisoned. So all of this material where Ichigo is panicking because he is trapped and they aren't responding to him is streamlined into just one scene in the anime. Now because this call is still connected in the manga, we actually see Ichigo react to Jidambo breaking in. In addition to this, the anime also cuts a scene with Hyosu staying behind so that Akon and Rin can escape the facility. The anime chooses to replace these two manga pages with this line of Hyosu telling Akon to get going. Ichigo hearing the screams of the different Shinigami doesn't include every single one within the anime. Instead, they have chosen a select handful of the quotes, and the anime adds an exclusive scene here of Rukia, who is encouraging the other Shinigami by saying that they must stand their ground because Ichigo will come. Now, the manga on the other hand, we don't really know who says Ichigo will come. Now, this is a minor change, but it adds to Ichigo's emotional response here, as we know that this line was said by Rukia in the anime. And of course, after this scene, we cut to the opening song. After the opening, we wrap up material from the end of chapter 500 with a mysterious individual having arrived and just killed Kilge. And then this person ends up drawing their sword against Urahara. Now all of this is just a straight up one-to-one -one adaptation from the manga. 
The anime then cuts a scene from the start of chapter 501, as within the manga it shows Ichigo's phone disconnecting his call with Urohara, as he struggles not to sink into despair with his feelings of powerlessness. The anime having removed this scene only ends up showing us Ichigo not being able to break the prison with his Getsuga Tensho, as we then cut to Byakuya and Renji's battle against Asnod. A line from Byakuya is removed from the anime where he tells Renji that attacking an unfamiliar enemy all at once is a foolish way to lose the advantage of having outnumbered them. Now after Renji objects to Byakuya fighting Asnod, there is a slight change with the reason why Byakuya is fighting the Sternritter. In the manga, he says that it's because he has more wisdom, so he's able to expose the nature of the enemy's abilities better. While in the anime, it's because Byakuya is concerned that his Bankai has been stolen and they can't afford to lose Renji's Bankai too. Now this once again kind of streamlines this conversation and removes the unnecessary fluff. As the point is conveyed via the anime and the manga, because Byakuya is fighting so that Renji can identify the enemy's abilities. Asnod's explanation of his fear-inducing arrows is streamlined in the anime also, as the line about him applauding Byakuya for enduring his feelings of fear is cut, along with him stating that an ordinary Shinigami who is struck by one of his arrows would have screamed and died from fear by now. Following this, the scene where Rukia's face is decomposing is adapted really well into the anime, and it definitely succeeds at being frightening. After Byakuya is stabbed by Asnod, a line is cut from the anime where he comments on him still standing. During Asnod's explanation of fear without a cause, which he describes as being instinctual, we see some amazing anime-only scenes of flies crawling up Byakuya's body, as he is covered by a countless number of them. After Byakuya yells out, the anime has an exclusive scene of him swinging several times against the Stenritter, but each of the attacks are evaded by him, and this is before he has his own Bankai used against him. The manga, on the other hand, just has Byakuya attack once before he is then attacked by his own Bankai. Asnod using Senbonsai Sakura is extended within the anime as we see the full sequence of its activation as opposed to the manga where Byakuya is just attacked by it. The anime does a much better job of making this feel way more impactful because seeing the Quincy use such an iconic power with the anime only visuals makes it look so unsettling, especially knowing that this is not Byakuya using this iconic power. Rukia reacting to Byakuya's drop in spiritual pressure after he is attacked is altered within the anime as we get to see who she is fighting during the first invasion of the Quincy. In the anime, it is revealed that she was actually confronted and attacked by the Sternritter Meninas. Now, in the manga, we know for years this was left ambiguous, and we didn't know who she was fighting against during this first invasion. Byakuya's defeat brings us to the end of the first half of this episode. And following this, we cut to Yuhobak and Hashwad, but a scene within the anime is cut where Hashwad tells Yuhobak that Byakuya is dead, as they speak about how it has taken longer than expected, because the Sternritters are not being ruthless enough. All of this is removed because Kubo at the time of releasing this chapter probably wanted Byakuya dead here, but it is speculated that fan backlash was so intense that Kubo was left with no choice but to revive him. So this might be the reason why this line about Byakuya dying is omitted here. Instead, we just cut to the arrival of Kimpachi within the anime. The anime expands upon the defeats of each of the Sternritters as Kimpachi's explanation of how he had defeated them is accompanied by some excellent anime-only visuals. This is yet again another Another scene where the anime does such an amazing job of adapting from the manga, and in general, this is what an adaptation is all about, doing things differently that fit the medium that the story is being told within. Now, following the scene where Ichigo yells out that he will protect everyone, which occurs at the mid portion of chapter 503, we cut to an anime exclusive scene of the Shinigami at the other side of the Garganta, saying that they cannot restore the exit from Hueco Mundo. We see that Hyosu is actually safe and alongside Akon. I think that it's strange that they have added this anime only scene here, but it may make sense if it ties into another anime only scene in a subsequent episode. The anime does an absolutely incredible job of depicting Driscoll activating Sasakibe's Bankai and Yamamoto recalling the first time that he had seen it. After Yamamoto is hit by an attack from Sasakibe's Bankai, a panel of Shuhei calling out to the head captain is cut from the anime, as we straight up just go into the flashback after the head captain is attacked. Now, this is because Shuhei calls out to Yamamoto again after the flashback in a very similar manner, and it just goes to show that the anime is cutting out needless padding and repetitions that exist within the manga. After Yamamoto challenges Sasakibe to take him down with his Bankai, we get an anime-only scene of their encounter. 
In the manga, we just get some dialogue of Yamamoto explaining how brilliant Sasakibe's Bankai was, along with a panel of his face with a second scar now on his head. However, the anime has an amazing exclusive scene here, which depicts everything that was off screen within the manga. The music, voice acting, and bright visuals all combine to really give this backstory so much emotion, making it really come to life. Now this Bankai activation of Sasakibe is my highlight for this episode. Within the manga, while Yamamoto is being attacked, Shuhei assumes that the head captain is unconscious, as he then charges towards Driscoll but is told to stop by Yamamoto. Now all of this is cut from the anime, as again the scene is streamlined for the sake of pacing, as we cut straight to Yamamoto defending the honour of his late lieutenant by killing the Sternritter. After Yamamoto rushes onto the battlefield in order to confront Yuhobak, we see some reactions from some of the captains who feel his spiritual power. Now, Siphon's reaction in the manga has her lieutenant ask her what she is reacting to, as she ends up scolding him for not knowing. This brief comedic moment is cut from the anime, as well as Shinji telling Momo that they have got to hurry away from the battlefield, because Yamamoto is about to let loose. Episode 5 concludes with Shunsui charging towards Robert as it takes us to the ending song. However, before the episode completely wraps up, there is a post credit scene that adapts the last 6 pages of chapter 505, which involves Yuhabak holding up Kimpachi by his neck, as he is disappointed that he was able to defeat one of the five great war powers so easily. The episode is brought to a close after Yamamoto arrives and he challenges Yuhobak. So following the defeat of Byakuya, Rukia, Renji and Kimpachi, and now that Yamamoto has gotten his revenge for the death of his lieutenant, and he has finally confronted Yuhobak, we have finally reached the end of episode 5. The next episode is going to be entirely focused on Yamamoto's battle against Yuhobak, and I absolutely cannot wait to cover it. And I really hope that next week we get to see a flashback, even if it's very brief, of the original battle between the Quincy and Shinigami that had occurred over a thousand years ago. In general, we seem to be continuing the pacing that was established by the first four episodes, with this most recent episode having adapted six chapters. Although the pacing of this episode in particular did feel much better, and I'd really felt like there were some scenes that were given a lot more room to breathe in this episode, that in my opinion, episode 5 is easily the best episode that we have had thus far. I I loved seeing Sasakibe activate his Bankai in the past, and just how well the anime did to maintain the serious tone and the pacing of the story in general. In general, the anime is known to have cut a lot of comedic moments that weren't necessary. Hopefully, by episode 5, you can understand why they are doing this. And also, they have removed a lot of scenes which repeat the same information twice within the manga. The Thousand Year Blood War arc is really picking up, and we may have the best episode of the first core of this final arc drop next week. The sixth episode of Bleach Thousand Year Blood War arc titled The Fire is by far the best episode that we have received thus far. I didn't think that they could top episode 5, but boy was I wrong. This episode faithfully adapts 5 chapters spanning from chapters 506 to 510 from the manga. All the while, it cuts out very little while managing to include several, yes several anime exclusive scenes that pad out the story and provide some great context to the final arc. So as with all of my manga vs anime comparison videos, I'm going to refrain from talking about scenes that are just straight up one-to-one -one adaptations from the manga, and I'm only going to be diving into what is cut, changed, or added in the anime. So let's begin by talking about what happens before the opening song. The episode begins with an anime-only scene that builds upon the Uryu scenes from previous episodes. We see him reading Soken Ishida's book on the history of the Quincy, and while turning the pages, he reads about a war between the Quincy and the Shinigami that had taken place over 1,000 years ago, but he had thought that this entire time that the Quincy and Shinigami had feuded 200 years ago, but apparently there was a prior encounter. He then recognises a drawing of a younger Yamamoto, as we then cut to the battlefield and are then shown the opening song. The episode begins with another anime only scene where Yamamoto is seen to walk towards Yuhobak, who is holding the lifeless body of Kimpachi. He picks up Kimpachi's body and lays it down on the ground, stating that it has been a thousand years and he has now come to take Yuhobak's life. We then cut to the start of chapter 506 where we see Shunsui battling the Sternritter Robert, and he talks about how their morale is also boosted when they know that their boss is fighting. When the Sternritters Nanana, Asnot, and Basbi attempt to ambush Yamamoto, in the manga each of them say a brief line, with Nanana questioning if the leader of the Shinigami is sure of what he is doing by fighting Yuhobak on his own. Asnot states that it's the end for him, while Basbi shouts out goodbye old man. Now these three personalised lines are cut down to only include 
good Baz B's line in the anime. Now this is a pretty harmless alteration that just cuts the needless padding here. After Shinsui speaks to Robert, we get some amazing anime only scenes. They showcase the explosion that erupts after Yamamoto protects himself from the Sternritter's ambush, as we see visuals of Hitsugaya, Soifon and Komomura, with this amazing eruption from behind them that lights up the entire scene. After Yamamoto cuts Yuhabak, we are shown the first of several brief flashbacks into the past, where we are shown the original battle between a younger Yuhabak and Yamamoto. This is of course expanded within the anime as opposed to the manga where we only have one panel, after Yuhabak recalls how seeing Yamamoto's anger reminds him of his younger self. We then get our first anime only fight sequence between the two of them that expands upon some off screen clashes that are shown in the manga. We see Yamamoto charge towards Yuhabak who avoids the attack and sends Yamamoto hurtling through the air. They clash onto the rooftop and they return to where they were standing. The anime here does such a fantastic job of adapting such little material from the manga, as they give the early portion of Yamamoto and Yuhabak's battle some added context before Yuha draws his blade and blocks an attack from Yamamoto and prior to Yamamoto activating his Bankai. After Yamamoto makes all of the flames vanish into a Zanbakdo at the end of chapter 506, the anime cuts to the reactions of Ukitake, Shunsui, Unohana and Hitsugaya from chapter 507, as it alters the pacing to show us Yamamoto saying Zanka no Tachi to coincide with Shunsui and Ukitake realizing Yamamoto has activated his Bankai. The manga on the other hand, he says Bankai before their reaction. Now this was switched around for the differences in pacing between the two mediums, since chapter 506 had ended on a cliffhanger which wasn't needed for the anime, as the anime had instead showed us the reactions of the captains first and then cut to Yamamoto saying Bankai and continuing his battle, showing us the scenes from the beginning of chapter 507, where Yuhabak informs Hashward about the last time that he had seen Yamamoto's Bankai. When Yuhabak describes Zanka no Tachi as a sword of hellfire, the anime and manga show different depictions of Yamamoto from the past, with the manga showing him from behind striking with his blade, while the anime shows him raising his Zanbakdo in the air with his flames encircling him. After Yuhabak realizes that Yamamoto's flames are now concentrated at the tip of his Zanbakdo, we get an anime only fight sequence here, where he fires some boulders towards Yamamoto, who effortlessly destroys them with the tip of his blade. Now this is just before he reveals the name of the first phase of his Bankai, which blows away everything that it touches. After Yamamoto explains Zanka no Tachi East and strikes towards Yuhabak, a scene is cut from the anime, where Yamamoto exclaims that not even Blutveen, the source of a Quincy's defenses, can stop his Bankai. After Yuhabak's blade is broken, we cut to another brief anime only flashback from 1000 years ago, as the head captain recalls when Yuhabak and his subordinates were defeated. We are shown a bloodied younger Yuhabak who is laying on the corpses of his fallen soldiers, with Yamamoto standing over him. This then cuts to present day Yamamoto who says that he will force him to remember that Yuhabak and his army are nothing but a horde of corpses waiting to be burned. Now this exclusive material occurs just before Yamamoto activates Zanka no Tachi West. After activating Zanka no Tachi West, we get yet another anime only flashback of Yuhabak recalling Yamamoto using a similar ability 1000 years ago, while he describes that his heat now reaches temperatures exceeding 15 million degrees. Following Hashwald's reaction to Zanka no Tachi West from the start of chapter 508, we then cut to an anime exclusive scene catching up with Udyu as he continues to read about the history of the Quincy. He finds out that the Quincy Empire were referred to as the Empire of Light. Their goal was to destroy Hollows, but they were opposed by the Soul Society who they had ended up invading. But during this battle 1000 years ago, the Quincy were wiped out by the original Gotei 13. Then 200 years ago, the Shinigami had decided to eliminate any surviving Quincy in the fear that if they were allowed to survive, they would disrupt the balance of souls between the human world and the Soul Society. After reading this, Uryu states that no matter how much they try, the Shinigami and Quincy will never get along. As we are shown some flashbacks of Soken and Ishida, and then Uryu teaming up with Ichigo during the Hueko Mundo arc, which is contrasted against Uryu refusing to help Ichigo in Hueko Mundo this time round because the Quincy exists to eradicate Hollows and Arankars, not to protect them from this supposed threat that Nell had warned Ichigo about. After Yamamoto notes that now that Yuhobak's sword is broken, he only has his arrows left to use, we are shown yet another anime exclusive flashback with Yuhobak being cornered. Strangely, we see a mysterious unidentified Shinigami standing behind Yuhobak on top of a pile of corpses, while Yuhobak faces a young Yamamoto covered in flames, as he charges up an arrow to fire at him. Now, the
the anime speeds up Yuhobak's activation of Church Song Sanctuary Prayers, as some dialogue before he activates it is cut from the anime. In chapter 508, Yamamoto reacts to Yuhobak raising his hand before even activating the ability. He states that there is nothing that he can do against him, but Yuhobak tells him not to just assume that the Quincy can only use Quincy crosses and Quincy arrows. This inconsequential line is cut as we streamline their battle into the Church Song and then immediately into Yamamoto activating Zankan Otachi Sal. To emphasize the horrific nature of Zankan Otachi South, the anime has some exclusive sequences to visually enhance and convey to us the activation of the third stage of Yamamoto's Bankai. There are some amazing scenes of skeletons rising from the ground, accompanied by some unsettling sound design, as we hear bones cracking, with the scene panning across the landscape, revealing a horde of undead corpses awakening at Yamamoto's side. They march towards Yuhobak, their enemy, while his church song sanctuary praise collapses. This is an amazing use of CGI and 2D animation which comes together to breathe life into the pages of the manga, which already do such a fantastic job of depicting the skeletal corpses marching towards their target. While the scene where Yuhobak recognizes the faces of his fallen comrades from a thousand years ago is one-to-one -one adapted from the manga, I have to comment on how well the scene was handled within the anime, with how the skeletal figures all transform into how they had looked when they were alive. This just adds to the unsettling feeling that this ability gives you, and it even makes you empathize with Yuhobak, who is seeing some of his comrades for the first time in a millennia. Then some scenes are rearranged as in the anime it cuts to Yamamoto giving a monologue about why he his bankai can't be stolen. But in the manga, before he talks about this, he walks away from Yuhobak as he explains that he is putting some distance between them, and if Yuhobak wants to come after him then he needs to cut down his former comrades. The anime has Yamamoto step back from Yuhobak and taunt him after he explains why his bankai can't be stolen. This is switched up in the anime because it expands upon Yuhobak's frustration here, as he is made to think about having to crush the corpses of his subordinates that are restraining him in order to go after Yamamoto. We get an another anime only scene where Yuhobak remembers his fallen comrades once again as he yells out. This is followed by a scene that cuts back and forth from the past to the present, with Yuhobak walking past the corpses of his men in the past which is mixed with Yuhobak in the present crushing the skeletal remains of his men as he breaks free to follow Yamamoto. This added scene just adds so much more emotion and emphasis on the original battle between the two of them as they even show us a full shot of all of Yuhobak's men who were killed by Yamamoto a thousand years ago. And this is one of my favorite added scenes in this episode as we get to see just how many subordinates Yuhobak had lost in their first fight. And it makes you better appreciate why he has taken revenge against the Soul Society 1,000 years later. The pain that Yuhobak is feeling after losing his comrades is contrasted against the Shinigami that Yamamoto has lost. As the anime cuts from a young and old Yamamoto, as the anime shows us a young and old Yamamoto cutting back and forth until we see a silent glimpse that reveals to us all of the Shinigami that have been slaughtered with an particular emphasis placed upon the loss of Sasakibe, which is the fuel to Yamamoto's fire during this battle. All of this happens before Yamamoto activates Zanka no Tachi North in the anime, which is expanded upon and is given some stunning visuals that convey the powerful nature of the final stage of his Bankai that ends any encounter with one final decisive strike. After it is revealed that Yamamoto was battling against an imposter, a flashback from the start of chapter 510 that explains the powers of the Sternritter doppelganger twins, Royd Lloyd, is cut from the anime. The two pages that are removed from the anime speak about how, at birth, the twins had looked so alike that they were mixed up and they they didn't know who was the eldest or the youngest. Because of how identical they were, they had mimicked each other from birth. They had both realized that they were doing this at the age of five, and when they had both turned 12, they had realized that they were able to mimic other human beings too. The older of the two Lloyd was able to mimic another person's powers and skills, as well as their appearance. He had in fact been defeated by Kimpachi earlier on, and the younger brother Royd was able to copy the memories, mind and appearance of another. And this is who Yamamoto had been battling this entire time. Now this brief explanation about the twins and the nature of both of their powers is omitted in the anime, but I think that it's for a very good reason, because it allows us to spend more time with a fan favorite character before the end of the episode. Now I am of course referring to Sosuke Aizen who has 2 minutes of screen time at the end of this episode as the anime expands upon his meeting with Yuhobak 
from chapter 510. This chapter briefly mentions that Yuhabak had offered Aizen a position within his army, but he had refused. And it shows us one panel of Aizen, which just depicts him tied to Chesama from a scene that recalls his sentencing at the end of the fake Karakura Town arc. The anime, on the other hand, blows the manga out of the water here as we cut to Muken and are actually shown the entire conversation between Yuhabak and Aizen. The two address each other as Aizen reveals that he knows about him, but he had never thought that he would end up seeing him with his own eyes. Aizen doesn't ask about why Yuhabak is here, since he can tell what is happening on the ground above him by just sensing the spiritual pressure alone. Yuhabak refers to Aizen as one of the five great war powers and offers an invitation for him to join his army, as he states that they both share in the same path of wanting to destroy the Soul Society. But Aizen confidently refuses the offer, as he explains that he cannot stand to work under the leader of the Quincy, who is only going to be following in his footsteps. After getting his answer, Yuhobak is about to leave, but Aizen asks if the real reason that Yuhobak had visited him was because he had seen Aizen's power as a threat to his own, to which Yuhobak agrees, and he elaborates that since Aizen has fused with the Hokyoku, it would take too long to kill him, and it would be too troublesome to take him with them and to restrain him again. Aizen commends Yuhobak as he agrees that it is best to shorten any time that the two of them spend on the same path together, since they would eventually target each other on the path that they share to destroy the Soul Society and to overthrow the Soul King. This extended scene helps you to better understand why Aizen had refused to join Yuhobak, as well as giving us some fan service by showing us a hyped encounter between two of the biggest villains in the series. I definitely have to praise the anime for including such an amazing scene and revealing more insight into the character of Aizen and why he would refuse to be let out of prison. Now this episode concludes with Yamamoto having his Bankai stolen and Yuhobak drawing his oversized Reishi blade in order to cut down and defeat the head captain. And this brings us to the end of episode 6, which wraps up by adapting all the way up to the end of chapter 510, leaving us on this cliffhanger of Yamamoto being supposedly killed by the real Yuhobak with so many additional scenes providing more of an insight into the original battle between Yamamoto vs Yuhobak, as well as learning more about the Quincy history via Uryu, it is safe to say that the anime once again adapts and improves upon the material from the manga when it comes to the 6th episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. I absolutely love how one episode after the other, we are seeing the utter demise of the Shinigami, and now that their leader has been defeated, there is little hope that remains for the future of the Soul Society. The highlight for this episode was definitely seeing Zankan Otachi South being depicted in anime form and the incredible reveal of the entire conversation between Aizen and Yuhobak when they had briefly spoken to each other in the central underground prison Muken. This episode slows down the pacing and gives the manga material more room to breathe as it adapts 5 chapters into the 20 minute span of this episode. I feel like we got enough time to spend with the external cast reacting to Yamamoto on the battlefield as well as having 2 additional fight sequences between Yamamoto and Yuhobak that were not in the manga. Episode 6 is by far my favourite episode thus far, and I feel like with each passing episode, the most recent instalment becomes my favourite. However, I struggle to believe if they can top this episode during the remainder of this first core of the anime. I loved seeing Yuhobak's former men getting a spotlight, as well as seeing each form of Zanka no Tachi being explained and properly showcased. This was a treat to watch and it was so worth the wait. The 7th episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc titled Born in the Dark is another incredible installment of the new anime series. Episode 7 adapts 4 chapters worth of manga material spanning from chapters 511 to 514. I think that this episode has the least amount of cut content and the most additions made out of the 7 episodes we've had thus far. A clear effort was made by Kubo and the anime staff to pad out the story by including several anime exclusive scenes, including some highly requested flashbacks from the original battle between the Quincy and the Shinigami from a thousand years ago. Now there is a lot to love about the latest episode of Bleach and I'm going to be breaking down and comparing it to the manga, seeing if they had cut or changed anything, as well as discussing the anime only scenes that they have added to the story. So let's begin our comparison by talking about what is shown before the opening song. Now this episode has quite a number of anime only additions, as we begin with a two minute exclusive scene 
revealing to us the explosive battle between the original Gotei 13 and the Quincy from a thousand years ago. It starts with a panning shot of the Sarite in ruin with several fires burning as a result of the conflict. We then see Yuhobak leading his army who march towards the Soul Society and they are surrounded by flames. We then cut to a younger Yamamoto who is front and center leading the original Gotei 13 to battle. Now these are entirely new character designs that were revealed only a week ago and now they have been included within the anime. Which means that Kubo has been sitting on these original Gotei 13 designs for several months, deciding to unveil them strategically before the episode that they feature within. Now these designs build upon the foundations laid within a panel found in chapter 511, where Kubo had drawn vague silhouettes of the original Gotei 13. Now ever since then we were desperate to see more of them and after 10 years of waiting we finally see the faces behind the myth of the original ruthless band of criminals that were responsible for sealing Yuhobak for a thousand years. Thankfully we do get this close up panning shot of each of the captains and they look very sinister. This is followed by a brutal sequence where we see each of them tear apart the Quincy who are made to regret ever having stepped foot into the Serete. Each of them gets a solid shout out here and even Unohana who ends up kicking things off by being the first to be shown to slice a Quincy in two. Yamamoto Zanpakuto is shown to be in its Bankai state with flames pouring from it as he marches towards Yuhobak. Of course, he is stepping on the charred corpses of the Quincy as the anime excels at conveying the extent of the defeat that has been suffered by the Quincy. It builds up to this shot of Yuhobak who is cornered with the bodies of his fallen soldiers littered around him. Now this exclusive scene concludes after it is revealed that Sasakibe had assisted Yama by ambushing Yuhobak from behind. And this of course is before Yamamoto delivers the final blow which ends up sending Yuhobak into a thousand year long slumber. Now this was the most impactful introduction out of any of the episodes we have had thus far. Everything from the new material, the visuals and music have all combined to grab your attention and hook you into this episode. This does a fantastic job of building upon the panel found within chapter 511 as we are familiarized with the original battle and we get to actually see each of the original Gotei 13 which is amazing, especially if they will return in some capacity during the continuation of the Bleach manga via a possible hell arc. After the opening, the episode begins by adapting manga material from the beginning of chapter 511 as we get the flashback of a young Shunsui sneaking into the head captain's office asking him about the painting on the wall, which depicts Yamamoto in a monstrous form that he had used to defeat Yuhobak. Now after Yamamoto is defeated, we are shown the reactions of Ukitake, Hitsugaya, Soifu and Shunsui, but in the manga we only really get to see Ukitake and Shunsui's reaction. When Yuhobak questions why Yamamoto didn't have Orihime heal his arm and why he was reluctant to have Ichigo fight on their side against Aizen, we get some more context within the anime via several added flashbacks that are overcast in this pink tone to match up with Yuhobak's words. After Yuhobak states that the head captain used to be different before, we are shown imagery from the first two minutes of this episode where the original Gotei 13 were revealed, instead of this very vague panel that we had within the manga. Now this is by far the biggest benefit of showing the original battle, as we are no longer left wondering what happened back then and how the Gotei 13 had looked back then. There was so much to imagine over the course of the 10 years, as Yuobak had described them to be a group of cold-hearted killers, feared by everyone. The first two minutes of this episode just builds upon the speech that's given by Yuobak right before he kills Yamamoto. In addition to the added visuals of the original Gotei 13, we also get an exclusive shot of Yamamoto teaching within the Shinigami Academy, which feels strangely nostalgic. Towards the end of chapter 511, when Yuhobak calls upon the Soul Dart to destroy what's left of the Soul Society, the anime once again expands upon this moment, as we are given some additional scenes of the soldiers violently taking out the Shinigami and causing more havoc. I think that they had added these scenes so that we are taken to the absolute lowest of lows, just before we get some hope following the arrival of Ichigo. The anime expands upon on this one panel within the manga where we see the splatters of blood in the air with the Shinigami gasping and yelling out in pain. I just think this is a great touch that didn't need to be done but it shows the attention to detail and the effort that they are going through in order to strategically cut, change and add content where it is necessary. A panel from the manga is cut from the end of chapter 511 where after Yuhobak tells Hashward that it's over, he says that the Gotei 13 captains are defeated so it's not going to be long before the Zero Division will show up, so it's best that they start to leave now before they arrive. Now this mention of Squad Zero is cut from the anime 
anime, and instead we are shown additional footage of Ichigo trying to break free from Kilge's prison. This added material expands upon the start of chapter 512, where he yells out for the Shinigami not to disappear and to hold on. After Ichigo arrives within the Serete, the anime shows us reactions from all of the Sternritters and Yuhobak, followed by the Shinigami also reacting. In comparison to the manga, we only get to see Yuhobak and the Shinigami react here. In the anime, after he arrives, we see Ichigo rescue Akon and take him to safety, but within the manga, he is just shown breaking through the portal before he starts to assess the situation. Now this is another nice touch that helps to build the tension and atmosphere of this scene, building on the manga material, which is what fans were asking for. Now Byakuya's final request to Ichigo is pretty much one-to-one -one adapted from the manga, with the anime really adding to the feels with the visuals, sad music, and specific emphasis that's placed upon the pouring rain. Ichigo's spiritual pressure following Byakuya's final request is given so much justice within the anime, as his rising spiritual pressure is depicted with this steam-like effect that builds up and unleashes as we are shown the anger on his face. Although this is a straight up adaptation from the manga, the anime just adds so much to this scene in particular and it just helps to bring it to life. In chapter 513, we see Ichigo charge up his power and rush towards Yuhobak, firing a Getsuka Tensho at him. After the attack pretty much fails, he is grabbed and pinned to the ground. Now the anime expands upon their first clash by giving us a minute long anime only fight sequence. As we see them clashing in the air, which is accompanied by the stunning, vibrant red and blue visual effects, which adds to the dynamic animation. Ichigo is thrown into the ground, where he then bursts out from the rubble as he fires his Getsuka Tensho, and we then return to the manga material, which leads to Yuhobak pinning Ichigo down and stabbing his throat, only to learn that he has Blutveen. Now this takes us all the way up until the end of chapter 513. In chapter 514, when Yuhobak explains how Kilge's spiritual pressure had seeped into the depths of Ichigo's soul, the anime has some nice visuals depicting this, and this just helps us to better understand what had happened, and how his Quincy powers were awakened. After Yuhobak states that he will force Ichigo into submission and take him to their fortress, we get an anime-only fight sequence where the Quincy leader summons several arrows that Ichigo deflects and he fires a Getsuka Tensho towards him. Yuha then attaches his arrows to boulders and he fires them towards Ichigo. This ends up crushing him and ending the exclusive scene. This specific sequence is under a minute worth of added content, which helps to flesh out Ichigo's encounter, because in the manga it had felt like Ichigo and Yuhobak had only a couple of clashes with some words that were exchanged before Yuhobak has to leave. The anime definitely does a better job than the manga during this particular moment. Before the episode wraps up, we get one final exclusive scene which shows us all of the Sternritters leaving. Now in the manga, we are only really shown Yuhobak and Hashwat leaving at the end of chapter 514. The anime pays particular attention to the Sternritter Meninas who towers over Rukia's lifeless body. Originally, the manga didn't even show who Rukia was fighting during the first invasion, so it's nice to see Maninas get a final line in before departing, as she assumes that she has killed Rukia. The episode wraps up with Ichigo taking one last stand to stop Yuobak and Hashward as he charges towards them only to have his Tensar Zangetsu broken by Hashward. They leave as the Quincy leader refers to him as his son born in the dark. We then cut to the title card right at the end before the credits start to roll. The end credits also feature an additional surprise as we get to see some more artwork from the recent full color manga spread that was drawn by Kubo of the original Gotei 13. This is a nice final added touch that helps to build upon all of the additional material that we had featured within this episode. And now this brings us to the end of episode 7, which adapts all the way up until the end of chapter 514, ending the Quincy's first invasion of the Soul Society. Episode 7 featured many additional scenes, while also faithfully adapting four chapters of the manga, with very little to no cuts or changes made. The anime definitely tops the manga in this week's episode due to the amount of exclusive material, which is combined with an incredible voice cast, musical score, and some of the most fluid and dynamic animation we've had thus far. Now this was by far one of my favourite Bleach episodes, and arguably it's better than episode 6. So much justice was done to the manga in this week's episode, and the pacing was slowed down to just 4 chapters, and usually they've been adapting 5-6 to six chapters per episode, so this week's episode was a welcomed presentation 
breath of fresh air. We get to see additional fight sequences from the past, as well as expanding upon Ichigo vs. Yuhobak, which was masterfully depicted within the anime. The eighth episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc is titled Shooting Star Project Zero Mix, and during this episode, we check in with the Soul Society as they deal with the devastating aftermath following the first invasion by the Quincy. Episode 8 roughly adapts five chapters with the manga material, spanning from chapters 515 to 519. This episode features some changes as well as several cut scenes, which are removed to streamline the story and to speed up some of the pacing while maintaining a serious tone. Some comedic elements had remained intact, especially featuring the Zero Division, but other comedic moments were cut altogether. So without further delay, let's begin my comparison because there are a few differences to go over between the anime and the manga here. As I break down and compare how the anime adapts chapters 515 to 519 of the manga into this week's episode. As always, I'll refrain from talking about scenes which are straight up one-to-one -one adaptations from the manga, and we will solely focus on what's being cut, changed, and added to the anime. The episode begins by adapting the material from the start of chapter 515. Isane's discussion with Unohana has a small section from the start of their conversation cut, where in the manga, Isane tells a captain that the wounded are finally being carried in, and that none of the wounded were brought in for treatment during the battle. Now this line is removed because this sentiment expressed by Isane is conveyed during their conversation, so it doesn't need to be spelled out for us at the start of their talk. After Isane apologizes, an internal monologue from her is cut. In the manga, she calls herself a fool as she realizes that more than anyone, Unohana had wanted to help those on the battlefield. This is another inconsequential cut since we don't need Isane to tell us this because Unohana explains why she couldn't leave her barracks because of Yamamoto's final order, which she didn't want to disobey. After Shunsui is seen standing where Yamamoto's body was destroyed, we are then shown the title card along with the opening song. When Ichigo is taken to the critical wound treatment unit to see Rukia and Renji, the anime cuts a panel of exposition from the manga which reveals details about their treatment. We learn that spiritual pressure treatment wasn't enough for the two of them and that they had needed reishi stitching in order to close up some of their severe wounds. Following this, Ichigo's interaction with Rukia is straight up one-to-one -one adapted from the manga and so is the captain's meeting where Soifon gets put in a place. This now takes us to the end of chapter 515. The first page of chapter 516 is removed from the anime where we vaguely see the Zero Division just prior to leaving the Royal Palace. When Ichigo is speaking to Mairi about his broken Tenzar Zangatsu, in the manga his broken blade is placed onto a table, while in the anime we see it submerged within a glass apparatus being examined. After Mairi states that a broken Bankai can never be restored to its original state, roughly five pages of the manga are cut from the anime. Now the first few cut pages involve Mairi giving the example of Komamura's Bankai as being the only one that has the power to heal, and this is because he has such a strong bond with his Zanbokdo. He also gives examples of how after the Bankai of Ikaku was damaged, it was only superficially repaired, and because of this, it is now far weaker than it was before. A second example is given of Renji's Bankai, which was broken by Byakuya. He talks about how the blade joints that were destroyed by Byakuya have never healed, as he explains that the damage that was done was permanent. These examples really help to explain the severity of Ichigo's situation, and it's a shame that this was removed from the anime, and hopefully we can get some of these lines delivered by Mayuri, instead delivered by Nimaya later on, as he gives examples to Ichigo after he arrives within his domain, hopefully in the anime. The other pages that were cut from the anime feature a muscular Khan goofing around, which are now condensed down to a single scene in the anime of Khan just running past Ichigo. Not much is lost here aside from Khan's muscular physique and the fun arts of him hanging around with Nemu. Now because they have removed all of this material, we just cut to Mayuri getting a call that the Zero Division are on their way. After the Tenchuren falls to the ground, a couple of manga panels are removed from the anime where Shunsui states that every member of Squad Zero is inside the Tenchuren. Ichigo then questions if all of them can fit inside that thing. The anime removes this brief piece of dialogue and instead streamlines the conversation to instead have Shunsui explain the Zero Division to Ichigo. The second half of the episode begins by adapting material from the start of chapter 517. The anime cuts another manga panel after Kurinji tells Unohana that she won't be able to fully restore Renji, Rukia, and Byakuya, as Kurinji states that if he stays within the Serite, he will die. Now this is removed from the anime and I'm assuming it's to avoid hinting at his death. And this is a similar removal to the scene of where Hashwad had told Yuhobak that Byakuya has died from episode 5 of the anime. The anime has another cut here and it's an important line 
line from Ichigo, which Urahara later quotes. And it's when Ichigo questions why does Zero Division want to take him to the Royal Palace, because his injuries are not serious enough and they can heal within the Serite. The line where he tells them that there is something that he needs to do is removed from the anime. After Kon starts to project Urahara's call, the anime changes around this scene. In the manga, Mayuri asks Kon what he is doing, to which he panics and says that he has no idea. But the anime just has Kon panicking on his own, asking what's going on. Additionally, the anime also cuts several panels of the 12th division chasing after Kon as Urahara yells at them not to ruin his modifications. Also, Kon figures out that he can cut the call by pressing his eyes, but Urahara ends up disabling this feature. This is another drawn out comedic moment that's removed from the anime, but the anime does end up telling us just enough before we end up moving to the next serious bit of dialogue. When Urahara states that he had wanted to contact Ichigo earlier, in the manga he explains that he couldn't because the 12th division had restrained Kon, so he couldn't use his communication system. But the anime on the other hand just has Urahara say that he couldn't contact them earlier because a lot had happened. After Grimjow interrupts that call, a comedic panel of Urahara, Orihime and Chad trying to get him out of their tent is removed from the anime. Now this earlier cut line where Ichigo says that there is something that he needs to do is now mentioned by Urahara. In the manga he asks if the thing that he has to do involves him getting his friends out of Wekomundo, as he reassures him that this is no longer necessary. Now this line from Urahara along with Ichigo's lines are removed. Now these brief exchanges are removed from the anime and it just ends up streamlining their conversation helping us just to get to the point. Now after Urahara cuts the call the anime removes the start of the exchange between Chad and Urahara. In the manga Chad questions that if Ichigo follows Urahara's advice and only thinks about himself he may want to run away from the fight. To which Urahara responds by telling him that surely he doesn't believe the words that he has just said. Now I'm glad that this was removed from the anime. I've never really liked this line from Chad and I remember when I had done my Chad character analysis I had some criticisms about this line too. It was really out of character for Chad to question Ichigo's resolve here since Urahara says it himself that nobody knows Ichigo more than two of his most closest friends. So yeah this is one cut that I can really get behind. Now keeping with this trend of cutting content the anime removes a page of manga content after Ichigo and the Zero Division arrive at Kukaku Shiba's palace. In the manga we see Ichigo speaking to Kukaku and it's another comedic moment that is removed. But I don't know about this one because it would have been really nice to see Ichigo and Kukaku speak for the first time since the Soul Society arc. When Ichigo and the Zero Division are launched into the air we do have a brief anime only scene where Kukaku is seen to launch a cannon firing the Tenshuren into the air. This was a really nice addition. We also have an excellent anime only visual when Kukaku mentions her uncle as we see a flashback of Ishin wearing his captain's coat standing beside Ganju and Kukaku. When Kirio begins to explain to Ichigo the structure of the royal palace, her line about each of the five trays being a city is cut from the anime and this is from chapter 519. We probably don't need to be told this within the anime since it does a great job of conveying to us visually the scale of each of these different trays. Especially when we get this really nice aerial view of Karinji's castle and you don't even need to be told that this is a city because of the sheer scale that is conveyed to us. When Ichigo is in the clear hot spring with Karinji and the injured Shinigami, a lot of him overreacting is cut from the anime and a lot of people were disappointed that a certain scene involving Rukia floating in the water was also cut from the anime and I can't say that I don't sympathize with them here. The comedy is cut down in the anime so that Karinji can get on with explaining how his hot springs work. Now some panels are also also cut from the anime where Karinji asks if Ichigo is Urahara's pupil as he reminds him of the hot spring that is located within Urahara and Yoriichi's playground. Now these are the very hot springs that Ichigo had used during the Soul Society arc when Yoriichi was first revealed to be a woman. In the manga, Karinji reveals that Urahara had analyzed his healing water and he had tried to recreate it in his own hot spring. The episode wraps up with Ichigo being told that he only needs to bathe within Cringy's hot springs for one night in order to feel twice as better than normal. We then cut to the end credits but the anime removes a comedic moment between Ichigo and Kirinji here where Ichigo drops a towel from his head as Kirinji tells him to keep it on or the core of his spiritual pressure will be sucked out of his head and he will die. The post credit scene which adapts the last couple of pages of chapter 519 has a slight change within the anime as we see Ichibei speaking to the Soul King instead of this vague mysterious Shinigami which is what was shown within the manga. Now this brings us to the end of episode 8 which questionably has cut a 
a lot of manga material, but hopefully some of it will be included later on, especially the lines of dialogue that were cut from Mayuri, where he gives examples of some broken Bankai that have not been healed. I think that these lines may be given to Uetsu Nimaya, as he can relay this information to Ichigo and Renji after they arrive within his domain. So there were a lot of cuts in this episode, and a lot of the comedic moments were toned down, as five chapters of the manga were streamlined into this week's episode, and these were very dialogue heavy chapters. We were riding off of the highs of episode 6 and 7, so understandably we could expect a change of pace with this week's episode. And of course this isn't one of the strongest episodes that we have had thus far, but it serves its purpose and it does well to convey to us the key facts revealed between chapters 515 to 519. The ninth episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc is titled The Drop, and it continues with Ichigo's healing at Karinji's palace, and then he visits Kiryo Hikifune along with Renji. In addition to this, during this episode we have the revelation that Shunsui has been appointed as the new head captain, and with his first order he has assigned Unahana to teach Kimpachi swordsmanship. Episode 9 covers material between chapters 520 to 524. Now while it seems like this is 5 chapters of material adapted into this episode, there are however some major changes made to the sequence of events and how they are told within the anime, as it differs a lot from the manga. These changes result in roughly 1.5 chapters worth of material not being adapted into this week's episode, and this is so that they could jump forward and begin Unohana's battle against Kimpachi a little bit ahead of time. So I'm going to talk about this more in detail later on in the video, but for now let's begin my comparison of episode 9 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, which roughly adapts about 3.5 chapters of manga material into this episode. Now as always, I'm going to refrain from talking about scenes which are 1 to 1 adapted from the manga, but in all honesty episode 9 features a lot of 1 to 1 adaptations, but they are given so much more breathing room in comparison to other episodes that we have had. Pieces of dialogue linger on the screen for a bit longer than usual, you spend more time dwelling with the emotions of characters, and things are just slowed down a lot. Now having said this, I will also be covering anything that's been cut, changed and added into the anime. So we begin by discussing the scene that happens before the intro song, as the anime adapts roughly the first three pages of chapter 520, where we see Nanao trying to get the attention of Shunsui, who has just learnt that the Central 46 have appointed him as the new head captain, as he's going to be filling the position of the late head captain Yamamoto as the leader of the Gotei 13. Now of course he doesn't appear to be too impressed by this, as Shunsui is the type of character to not want to get too involved, as he's very laid back and kind of lazy. After the intro song, we cut to Ichigo at Karinji's palace as he is forced under the water for about 100 seconds. For the most part, the comedic moments between Ichigo and Karinji remain intact, aside from a line that's cut from the anime after Karinji calls out to his subordinates. In the manga, he tells them to hold him down tight this time. Now this line is removed from the anime, and additionally a small panel of Ichigo struggling against his two subordinates is also streamlined within the anime, as it goes on a little bit longer in the manga. Just before Karinji punches Renji, the scene is slightly prolonged within the anime, as we see him walk towards Renji who is seen to be trembling. Now this is further emphasised in the anime, as it highlights that he hasn't completely healed, but Renji doesn't want to be left behind while Ichigo goes on to progress into the next palace. Following this, Shunsui's meeting with the Central 46, where he appoints himself with two lieutenants and reveals that Unohana will teach Kimpachi Zanjutsu, is pretty much one to one adapted from the manga. And the anime adapts all the way up until the end of chapter 520 after Unohana is revealed to be the first Kimpachi. After Ichigo and Renji land within Kiryo Hikifune's palace, a comedic scene is removed from the anime where Renji asks how long Khan has been following them. Ichigo says that he must have hidden within his clothes on the way to the Soul King's palace, and he further goes on to insult Khan by saying that he must have been excited about going to a hot spring, but then only to be disappointed when he had seen all of the muscular guys there. So this is the reason why he had remained hidden within Ichigo's clothes. Now the anime removes this and it just transitions into Kiryo introducing herself to the two of them. When Ichigo and Renji start to eat, there is an anime only scene of them eating without any dialogue, and this replaces a text only manga panel as they admit that they were starving and they should start to dig in. After Hikifune explains to them that she uses up all of her spiritual pressure when cooking, and as a result of it she loses a lot of weight, a line following this is cut from the anime. 
In the manga, she adds to her explanation by saying that she has to remain fat in order to cook, otherwise her body won't be able to hold up with her cooking. Now in the manga, after Ichigo and Renji are fired towards Nimaya's palace, we see them arrive in the next chapter. But the entirety of chapter 522 and the first half of chapter 523 are not adapted into episode 9 of the anime. All of these scenes that introduce Oetsu Nimaya and Ichigo and Renji beginning their training with the Asuchi are held back so that we can just cut straight to Muken, where we begin Kimpachi vs Unohana, which starts at the midway point in chapter 523. The anime does an excellent job of setting the atmosphere of Muken here by building upon some of the manga panels we have. And I have to comment on how well the anime adapts the remaining material of this chapter. Specific scenes are allowed to linger, there is a sense of tension, and the anime adapts the manga one to one but it does so perfectly. The animation, voice acting, and stunning visuals which introduces to one of the best battles in the series between two legendary captains. Chapter 523 concludes after Shunsui delivers a monologue about Unohana Yachiru and how he was aware that her battle against Kimpachi would be a fight to the death. The beginning of chapter 524 is extended slightly, as we see Isane reading a letter left behind by Unohana and Yachiru picking up Kimpachi's eye patch. Now these two lieutenants emotions are further emphasized within the anime as we cut back and forth with anime only footage of Kimpachi battling Unohana during the lieutenant's emotional reaction here. Shunsui's words from earlier echo in our mind that there will only be one survivor as the anime plays upon this narrative with some epic music by Sagisu and the lieutenants have having a heartfelt reaction. Now this was definitely one of my favourite moments of this episode and the anime really did the manga justice here. Now for the remainder of chapter 524, the anime faithfully adapts the material from the manga once again and it really is taking its time with each scene. There was a perfect balance of pacing between the dialogue scenes and the action scenes. And episode 9 concludes with Unohana admitting that the flaw Kimpachi had placed upon himself is because of a sin that she had committed. And this adapts material all the way up until the end of chapter 524. Now the battle between Kimpachi and Unohana lasts for a further two and a half chapters as it concludes midway through chapter 527. And with episode 10 being titled The Battle, there is every chance that we may have the entire episode centered around their fight. Now if this is the case then it would mean that we would have an additional two or three chapters worth of material adapted into the episode. Now I would love for this to be the case and for episode 10 just to feature their fight, but realistically speaking we may have their fight for the first half of the episode and with the second half adapting the cut material from this episode where we are introduced to Nimaya's palace and Renji and Ichigo beginning their training. Now episode 9 again features the slowest pacing out of any of these episodes we've had thus far, having only really adapted three and a half chapters with a small amount of additions and cuts in terms of the material that was adapted. Episode 9 was very faithful to the manga, but what do you expect when it adapts such little content from the actual source material? Despite this, it was a breath of fresh share to have the pacing slowed down considerably as we get all of the key details within the manga accurately conveyed in the anime. Information about Kiryo Hikifune's food, Shunsui adjusting into his new role and most importantly we get adequate time with Unohana and Kimpachi. The early portion of their battle introduces us to their long-standing history as well as teasing us for the next episode where their battle will continue and hopefully conclude. I do pray that episode 10 reveals to us more information about their backstory as well as the sin that Unohana was referring to. All in all, I'm really glad that they saved all of the scenes from Nimaya's palace for later, as the pacing has purposefully been rearranged so as to not distract us from this major battle between the two Kimpachis. The 10th episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc titled The Battle continues with Kimpachi's battle against Unohana, as well as catching up with what Ichigo and Renji are doing as they arrive within Nimaya's palace. Now the pacing of this episode is a little all over the place in comparison to the manga, but hopefully via this video you'll understand what has been adapted into the anime from where in the manga. As episode 10 begins by adapting material from chapters 525 to the first page of chapter 528, and we also back tracked a material that was not included last week as content from chapters 522 and half of chapter 523 are also adapted. Now altogether this week's episode covers about four and a half chapters worth of manga material. Now while we slow the pacing down it is done so that a lot of the dialogue during the Unohana vs Kimpachi fight can be conveyed to us without any omissions. Now I do have some criticisms about the sequence of events during this episode and last week's episode but I'll talk more about that later on in the video. For now 
let's begin my comparison of episode 10 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc and as always I'll refrain from talking about any scenes that are one to one adapted from the manga and we will solely focus on what's been cut, changed and added onto the anime. Before the intro song we see the first three pages of chapter 525 adapted into the anime. Kimpachi's battle against Unohana continues here as he has an internal monologue where he admits that he has lost consciousness several times. Now this scene includes a few anime only clashes that expand upon the panels within the manga and it was nice to see them build upon Kimpachi's monologue with some new fight sequences here. After the intro song we begin with the flashback where Unohana is hunting down vandals on the outskirts of Rukongai. This is pretty much one to one adapted from the manga as are the remainder of the scenes from chapter 525 which end with Kim Pachi successfully landing a strike against Unohana. Chapter 526 begins with Unohana countering Kimpachi and then healing herself just before she activates her Bankai. Upon activating her Bankai, we get some amazing anime only scenes here that elaborate upon her activation. This is completely shown as we see her Bankai transform into this red viscous liquid. After Kimpachi yells out, they charge towards each other and we get some anime exclusive fight sequences that help to flesh out their encounter. During this brief exclusive scene, we get to see more of Minazuki in battle as we see them clashing several times as well as seeing Unohana healing herself as it seems like the atmosphere has been altered by her Bankai activation and I'm guessing that anyone within the vicinity of a Bankai can be healed by it and you can assume here that a Bankai allows her to prolong her battles by injuring as well as healing at the same time. She also uses the thick red liquid around them to fire it towards Kimpachi several times. Now there is also this amazing moment where Unohana repeatedly strikes in front of herself. She does so with immense speed, charging towards Kimpachi, knocking him off of his feet. Now this is one minute worth of additional material within the battle that ends with Kimpachi saying that he is melting away, as we see the two of them in skeletal form. The anime does a fantastic job of emphasizing this with some strong visuals that build upon the small manga panels that we have. When Kimpachi thanks Unohana for letting him know what a true battle really is, he strikes down towards her, and in the anime we see Unohana's face from a different perspective, as it's kind of elaborate elaborated upon that she was cut across the face here. When Unohana explains about the tip of her sword being used to not kill Kimpachi but to nurture him, in the manga we see her blade depicted normally but within the anime it is in its Bankai state with the viscous red liquid all around it. The beginning of chapter 527 we see Unohana defeated by Kimpachi as the anime adds to the gore of this scene by emphasizing the fatality of her injuries. The episode reaches its halfway point by adapting all the way up until the 11th page of chapter 527. 27, as Kimpachi is finally able to hear his Zanpakuto speak to him. Now the first half is definitely the stronger portion of this episode and the more faithful one as we have a lot of one to one adapted material as well as having some additional scenes that pad out the battle between the two captains. And in addition to all of this they had made the battle look so much more visually better within the anime. After the mid roll the second half of the episode begins and it takes us back to chapter 522 as the first page of the chapter is cut from the episode where Mira tells Nimaya that Ichigo and Renji have arrived at his palace. In the anime it instead begins with the second page where Ichigo, Renji and Kon have arrived at his palace. Now before Nimaya's lights turn on, a couple of comedic manga panels are cut from the anime where Kon complains about being used as a cushion again and about how he was dragged to come here and he had wanted to stay at Kirio's palace. The reaction to Nimaya's lights is also streamlined within the anime as he cuts to the chase and very cringingly introduces himself in English as the number one Zampak creator. Another panel is cut from the anime where the girls react to Ichigo and Renji within Phoenix Palace. After Nimaya threatens to send the two of them back home when he realizes that they are no fun, a panel is cut from the anime where Renji and Ichigo whisper to each other and ask whether if he is serious about sending them home and they both agree to bow to him as they plead with him to stay. After they are shown Nimaya's real palace, a line from Mira is removed from the anime where she tells them that Nimaya doesn't want to accept that this is where he lives, hence why he has created a fake palace. Two panels from the manga where Nimaya kind of repeats what he is saying but with different wording are removed and this doesn't really take anything away from his explanation about how Renji and Ichigo have been treating their Zanpakuto. Just as Ichigo and Renji are attacked by their Asauchi, we then cut back to Kimpachi leaving Muken in an anime only scene as the episode then cuts to the end credits. After the ending song we are shown a post credit scene that starts to adapt from page 12 of chapter 527 all the way up until page 1 of chapter 528 and we learn that 3 days have passed since Ichigo and Renji arrived within Nimaya's palace and they were attacked by the Asauchi. This 
this material is one-to-one -one adapted from the manga as we see Ichigo stood in front of Kurosaki Clinic before the teaser for the next episode titled Everything But The Rain is shown. Now for the most part this episode has one major complaint from me and it's the placement of events that resulted in the dramatic conclusion of Kimpachi vs Unohana happening before the comedic sections at Nimaya's palace. I feel like the way that these sections were placed within the manga it was much better than the anime. The tension was maintained as within the manga we are shown Nimaya's palace until the three day training begins. Kimpachi vs Unohana fills this three day gap and then we return to Ichigo being kicked out and the everything but the rain flashback beginning. I feel like the manga definitely does a much better job of maintaining the serious tone after the Kimpachi and Unohana fight. Because after its conclusion Ichigo ends up being kicked out from Nimaya's palace and the tension is being added upon but in the anime I felt like it was detracted by having the early portions of the Nimaya stuff straight after Unohana's death. Now this of course is just my opinion and I would like to know how all of you had felt with the jarring contrast between the first and second half of this episode. I do understand that they didn't end up including the Nimaya scenes in last week's episode and this is because I had assumed that episode 10 was going to focus entirely on Kimpachi and Unohana's battle with a lot of additional material being included but this was not the case. Now I think that they could have included these scenes in episode 9 of Nimaya's palace and then had episode 10 focus entirely on Kimpachi vs Unohana with the end of the episode concluding on Ichigo being kicked out of his palace. In general, quite a lot had happened during this episode as we once again slow down the pacing from the usual 5-6 to six chapters per episode as we only have 4.5 chapters adapted into episode 10. Now a lot of the material was faithfully adapted from the manga while we did have some nice additions in the form of an exclusive fight sequence during Kimpachi vs Unohana as well as cutting down some of the comedic moments at Nimaya's palace. Now what I did say it in my review for this episode that I uploaded yesterday, I really enjoyed seeing how Unohana's Bankai was adapted adapted here. It was absolutely stunning and it definitely was my highlight for this week's episode. The anime thankfully did not remove any key pieces of dialogue between Unohana and Kimpachi, as all of these details within the manga were necessary to include here so that you could understand the unique bond that these two characters share and why they had to fight in order to awaken Kimpachi's full potential. So we are now nearing the end of the first core of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime as we only have really two weeks left because straight after the 10th episode was aired an announcement was made on the official Bleach anime Twitter that episode 12 and 13 will air together in a one hour special on the 26th of December. Now I cannot wait to see how the next two weeks pan out as we will finally begin to have the highly anticipated Everything But The Rain flashback arc being adapted into anime form. There are a lot of high expectations for the next section of manga material as we go into the next three episodes. The 11th episode of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc titled Everything But The Rain continues on from last week's episode. Following Ichigo just as he has been sent back home from the Soul Society. Now this episode adapts material from chapters 528 of the manga all the way up until the midpoint of chapter 533 as we have roughly five and a half chapters worth of manga material in this week's episode. Now there are a lot of comedic moments that are cut out with some scenes also being streamlined as the episode tries its best to convey to us the key moments of this story without disrupting the tension and seriousness of some specific scenes. As always I'll refrain from talking about scenes which are one-to-one -one adapted from the manga and I'll only focus on what's been cut, changed and added to the anime. Before the intro sequence we have material from chapter 529 as the first four pages of the chapter are adapted. Now this is where Nimaya explains to Renji why Ichigo was unsuccessful at submitting an Asauchi. After the intro song we begin with material from chapter 528 where Ichigo is stood in front of Kurosaki clinic in the pouring rain. Now this initial segment of the episode is streamlined as his commentary on how his body had gotten here from Urahara's shop is cut from the anime. In the manga he comments on how he is not in his Shinigami body anymore and he thinks about how he had left his body at Urahara's shop. He even yells out to see if Urahara is around but he remembers that he is still in Huecomundo. He then deduces that his dad must have brought his body here and the thought of seeing his dad after having failed is too much for him so he runs away. In the anime all of this is omitted and instead we cut to Ishin just greeting Ichigo but he realizes that he has run away. While at Ikumi's place we see Ichigo showering and changing into a fresh pair of clothes. Now this scene is also streamlined within the anime as in the manga while he is in the shower he comments on how it was good that Urahara, Chad and Orihime were not in the world of the living, as he doesn't know how he would be able to face them after having failed to have reforged his Zanpakuto. He then especially singles out his dad, telling himself that how is he supposed to face him after having failed. 
and the anime instead streamlines all of this in the monologue to him saying that how can he face them as he doesn't mention anyone specifically as he is embarrassed by being kicked out of the soul society without having his zanbakuto fixed. Additionally the interaction between Ichigo and Ikumi is also streamlined as in the manga Ikumi tells him that she has dried his clothes and tells him to put them on and to just go home as she says that it's a good thing that her son was asleep as he would have been annoyed if she knew that she had let Ichigo take a shower here. Now this is cut from the anime as we just see Ichigo apologize to Ikumi and a few speech bubbles are also cut from the anime before Ikumi tells him that she is like his older sister. In the manga she reassures Ichigo by telling him to rely on her if he is lonely and if he is going through a rough time or even if he is just in the neighborhood. Now these points end up being cut for the sake of pacing since the point that she is making is still conveyed without all of this extra fluff. Following this a comedic exchange between the two of them is also cut from the anime where Ichigo tells her that she must have some nerve to think that she is his older sister when she is 10 years older than him. Instead of this being in the anime we just hear the doorbell ring and Ishin arrives in his Shinigami attire. Another difference between the anime and the manga is that in the manga before Ichigo leaves Ikumi hands to him an umbrella because it's still raining outside but this scene is cut from the anime which instead decides to emphasize the fact that Ichigo has left behind his substitute Shinigami badge. When he gets back home with his dad two panels of comedic dialogue from Ishin are cut from the anime where he tells Ichigo that it's been a while since he has been home as he comments on how it's not anything new for Ichigo to be away from his home for days at a time as he then asks if he wants some food to eat but Ichigo tells him to cut it out. Now again this is removed in order to maintain the tension of the scene in the anime which instead skips and just shows Ichigo commenting on his dad being dressed in his Shinigami attire. The anime also shortens down the two pages of flashback at the end of chapter 528 where Masaki tells Ishin her name and that she is a Quincy. In the manga we see her elaborate a bit more as she runs towards Ishin asking if he is okay and he thanks her for saving him. He also feels embarrassed that a captain was helped out by a girl but Masaki offers to heal him as Ishin comments on how she was able to defeat this thing all on her own. The anime doesn't include all of this as most of this was Kubo just teasing the readers towards the end of this chapter so that it would have a suspenseful cliffhanger. We don't really need any of this at this moment since we're going to see this exchange between the two of them and who Masaki had defeated later on in the episode. The Everything But The Rain flashback begins by adapting material from chapter 529 as it takes us 20 years into the past where we see a younger Rangiku and Ishin who is the captain of the 10th division. Now Rangiku looking for Ishin is cut down in the anime as in the manga she ends up borrowing a tray from a couple of Shinigami as she fires it towards a tree where Ishin was hiding in. He falls out of it and she kicks the tray into Ishin's face breaking it. In the anime she instead kicks him out of the tree as the comedic scenes between the two of them are also cut short. Two pages of them joking around are not in the anime where Ishin is suspicious that she is just handing over all of her work to him and a gag between the two of them where he comments on how she is sweating which is giving her assets a nice glistening shine is also cut. Now I can appreciate why this wasn't in the anime and again it's just comedic moments that don't really add much to the story because we do see Ishin goofing around with his subordinates immediately after where he picks up a young Hitsugaya and he tells him that he is really proud of him and that he is going to make a fine captain in the future. And the anime also keeps an additional comedic scene where Ishin repeatedly asks who had eaten his dumpling while Hitsugaya dodges the question. I love that they had retained all of this comedic banter as I think that it's really important to show that Ishin was very comfortable with his subordinates and the kind of dynamic that Squad 10 had before Hitsugaya became captain and Rangiku was his lieutenant. Now moving on to chapter 530 the exchange between Masaki and Ryuken's mother is also streamlined within the anime. As in the manga she elaborates about her school by saying that she had recently found out that cabbages and pickles are free in the cafeteria. Now this line is cut from the anime and after Ryuken's mother scolds her in the manga Masaki says that she understands as she comments on how delicious the meat is. Now this isn't in the anime. After Ryuken arrives onto the scene a panel is cut from the anime where Ryuken's mother tells him that she will have them prepare dinner for him and she orders him to get Katagiri to clean up after he is finished. Katagiri telling Ryuken that his dinner is ready is cut from the anime as she just ends up putting the food down and Ryuken proceeds to speak to her about Masaki's happiness. The two Shinigami from earlier who Ishin had told to flee if it starts to rain have a couple of panels of dialogue cut from the anime. In the manga they comment on how it is now raining but they can't return to the soul society because if they do they would be punished for it. They decide to just hide as they leave the rest to Ishin. The anime cuts this out and instead shows them two hiding with Ishin commenting on how he will lure out the creature that is targeting the Shinigami. 
After Ishin begins his battle with White, an entire page from chapter 531, where Aizen reacts to this development is cut from the anime. He realizes that the captain of Squad 10 is on the battlefield without any authorization. So he tells Gin and Tozen that this is a great opportunity for them as he wants to watch the fight up close. Now the anime does not include this, as instead it shows Aizen appearing later and cutting down Ishin. Surprisingly, the anime does have an exclusive line here where Ishin comments on how the Hollow White is getting smarter after every Shinigami that it devours. Now he says this line after being surprised that White isn't fighting like a Hollow, but instead like a Menos, after witnessing it firing a Saro towards the Squad 13 Shinigami. After Ishin ends up being cut down, Aizen's monologue where he speaks about the Ryatsu concealing cloak from the start of chapter 532 is cut out of the anime. He thanks Urahara and references the Turn Back the Pendulum arc and I feel like this is the only omission in this episode which kind of bothered me as the information about the cloak would have been really nice to know as Aizen ends up explaining how the cloak works and he even smugly thanks Urahara for the convenient parting gift before he was exiled of course. Ishin yelling out who had attacked him just now is cut from the anime and so is the reaction of Gin, Tozen and Aizen. As in the manga, Aizen tells them that they should leave now and how their work is done, as Ishin won't be able to use his Bankai which will take a heavy toll on his body. Now I assume that some of this isn't included because the three stooges don't really end up leaving the scene. And the anime cuts down the exchanges between the three of them and we just have Aizen explain how the hollow that they had created is called white because of the whiteness that is within him, despite him being covered in black armor. Now this is just another Another example of a few panels that are streamlined and condensed for the sake of pacing. The anime cuts an inner monologue from Ishin where he thinks to himself that he can't activate his Bankai because his wounds are too deep, resulting in him being unable to focus his spiritual pressure. After White self destructs, Tozen commenting on it is cut from the anime as well as the reaction from the three of them. Instead, we just see Ishin and Masaki speaking. Now, this episode ends halfway through chapter 533, as one line from Tozin is cut from the anime, where he explains why White was a failure, stating that they had created it for the purposes of holifying a Shinigami, not a Quincy. Now, after the end credit song, we have an unexpected post credit scene, which is exclusive to the anime. There is no dialogue here, as we just see Uryu standing in the pouring rain, and we see a mysterious figure off in the distance, who is revealed to be hashtag world. Now I am assuming that the anime will show us how Uryu had ended up joining the Wandan Reich, and additions like this very brief scene at the end of this episode was sorely needed within the manga. Now this after all was a story arc where Uryu was meant to shine, so I am really looking forward to the additional scenes involving his character in next week's episode and in the second core of the anime later on next year. As during Jump Faster 23, the voice actors and even Kubo himself had hinted at Uryu having more of a spotlight in the second core, with more exclusive scenes that would help to flesh out his role in the story. The first core of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc anime has just wrapped up by releasing two episodes yesterday as we continue with the Everything But The Rain flashback which concludes within episode 12 and episode 13 continues by covering the entirety of the Blade Is Me material from the manga. Episode 12 is titled Everything But The Rain June Truth and it covers material from the halfway point of chapter 533 all the way to the end of chapter 537. It spans a total of four and a half chapters and the final episode of the first part of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime adapts chapters 538 to chapter 542 covering a total of five chapters worth of manga material. Now this week we have nine and a half chapters adapted which wraps up the first core of the anime which in total adapts 62 chapters of the manga into 13 episodes of anime. So I'll start by comparing the events of episode 12 to the manga and as always I'll refrain from talking about scenes which are one to one adapted from the manga and I'll solely focus on what's been cut, changed and added to the anime. We begin episode 12 with the second half of chapter 533 which is adapted before the intro song. We see Ishin reporting his recent visit to the world of the living during a captain's meeting and Masaki showing holification symptoms towards the end of the chapter, which coincidentally Urahara notices when he was conveniently walking past her. Now this material is pretty faithful to the manga, aside from Masaki's discussion with her friends, which is cut down significantly. But the 
anime still ends up conveying the general gist of what they were talking about, as it's just her friends teasing Masaki about living with Ryuken. After the intro sequence, two pages from the start of chapter 534 are cut from the anime. Now this involves Rangiku reading a note left behind from Ishin, telling her to make an excuse in order to explain to the head captain why he has left for the world of the living again. She of course isn't very happy about this, as she complains about his lackadaisical attitude towards his job. After Ishin appears and kills the hollow that was about to attack Ryuken and Masaki, a gag panel is cut from the anime where Ishin tells Ryuken that there is no need to thank him, as he doesn't accept thank yous from dudes. The halfway point of episode 12 adapts up to the end of chapter 534, as we begin the following chapter with Urahara's explanation of how to reverse Masaki's holification. Urahara's explanation of holification and soul suicide is streamlined within the anime, and it's also rephrased slightly to avoid any confusion. And it seems like this was definitely a script alteration made by Kubo, as the wording is very meticulously rearranged in order to explain what holification is exactly, what was the purpose behind it, and why it was ultimately deemed too dangerous to continue researching. Now because Urahara speaks about an uncontrollable monster being formed and the end result of holification being soul suicide, he ends up conveying all of the talking points without any interruption. This is a little different from the manga where a reference is made to a Quincy being holified which is outside of the original purpose of holification. But Urahara doesn't mention this until later on in the anime, instead he combines all the talking points together and he speaks about soul suicide a little earlier than in the manga. Urahara during an anime only scene explains that currently Masaki is a hybrid of a Quincy and a Hollow. So in order to counter this, she needs somebody who is a hybrid of a Shinigami and a human, in order to tip the balance the other way and to restore the balance of her soul. Now this I think is better explained within the anime and it's thanks to these additions that are made to the script. Another big addition is made to Urahara's wording as he explains that the hollow white will be passed down to Masaki's descendants. In the manga, it seemed like this was limited to just Masaki, but the anime elaborates and helps us to understand how Ichigo inherits the hollow from her. Now while Ishin is in the special Gigai, he will be unable to use his powers as this spiritual pressure will be used to counter and hold back the hollow. When Ishin appears within Masaki's inner world to protect her, the anime heavily avoids showing any of Masaki's nudity that is present within the manga. Additionally, a gag panel is also cut from the start of chapter 536 after Ishin warns the Hollow that he won't let it lay a finger on Masaki. In the manga, he jokes by commenting on the Hollow's confused expression, since the Hollow would have been confused by Ishin's remark since it doesn't have a body. After landing the Getsuka Tensho against the Hollow, a few gag panels are cut from the anime where Masaki and Ishin interact. Now some of these gag lines are instead rearranged and added to Masaki while she is talking in her sleep, after Ishin links their souls together. Now, Another big cut that is made here is to Masaki's assets which are fully on display within the manga but they don't end up making it to the anime which is pretty disappointing to some people out there. When Ishin narrates what had happened after saving Masaki, a panel is cut from the anime which explains that it was Ryuken's decision to have Masaki leave the Ishida family as it was his way of letting go of her. When Ishin speaks about Masaki being like the sun, we get some incredible anime only visuals that emphasize Ishin's explanation as it helps us to understand and how she was the center of his world. Episode 12 cuts to the credits after adapting all the way up to the end of chapter 536. After the end credits, we do get a lengthy post credit scene which adapts all of chapter 537 aside from the last few pages which are left for the end of episode 13. Now during the explanation of how Masaki had died, we see a lot of amazing anime only visuals that help us to understand Ishin's explanation. We get to see new visuals of Masaki battling the Grand Fisher, as well as Ryuken reading Soken Ishida's book on the Quincy history, where he learns about the sealed Quincy King. Now some panels of Ishin explaining why he didn't go to help Masaki are cut from the anime, as some of the dialogue here is rearranged in comparison to the manga, and it's streamlined into the post credit scene. Now this includes Ishin asking Ichigo if he knows about what had happened to Uryu's mother, and Ichigo says that Uryu isn't the type to talk about his family. Now this isn't included because later on Ishin speaks about Osvalen and how Katagiri had died 3 months after Masaki. 
Episode 12 wraps up with Ichigo ready to return to the Soul Society as episode 13 continues on by adapting chapter 538 of the manga. Before the opening song, we see Ichigo return to Nimaya's palace, but the explanation where Mira speaks about Ichigo being sent home with the intention of having him return within a day is cut from the anime. Now this is about three dialogue bubbles from the start of chapter 538, which don't make it into the anime. This episode instead cuts to the intro as Ichigo selects one of his Asauchi, and Nimaya agrees to personally reforge his Zanpakdo. After the intro song, some dialogue is cut from a pair of Squad 10 Shinigami who are training. As they talk about the state of Squad 10, noting that Captain Hitsugaya has now lost his Bankai, as they conclude that he is finished as a captain. Now this isn't included within the anime as we just see Hitsugaya appear before the sword instructor of Squad 10 as he requests to learn the basics from him. After Hitsugaya arrives, a couple of panels involving the two gossiping Shinigami reacting to his arrival are also also cut from the anime. After we see Kensei and Mashiro training Hisagi, we cut to material from chapter 539 as we catch up with the Soul Society's Research and Development Institute. This is instead of having a scene with Komomura which is rearranged and added on later in the episode in order to streamline his scenes. Now in the Research and Development Institute, we see Akon tune into Mayuri's room and we get some anime only lines that you can hear as Mayuri speaks about giving birth to a new Ashisogi Jizo. Now this is incredible added content that was not present within the manga and I love that they had made this addition here as it's foreshadowing some of his battles later on. Now when we cut to the Omaida family, the entire scene is streamlined within the anime as the gags are cut down between Omaida and his younger sister and we don't even see his brother who is introduced within the manga. In the anime, he agrees to play ball with her but in the manga, his brother arrives offering to read her a book but she decides to run away from him. Either way, they leave Omaida alone so that he can think about why Soifon didn't take him with her. After this scene with Soifon, we then cut to the material from the end of chapter 538 where Komomura enters the cave to speak to the elder. But surprisingly, we don't get to see Iba in the anime who is seen to be waiting for his captain outside the cave. Now I said it in my review, but I'll say it again here. I'd really love the exchange between Komomura and the elder. I think that the anime did an incredible job of adapting this from the manga with the tense atmosphere and the very impactful voice acting, it was gripping to watch and it was fascinating to learn more about Komomura's clan who have been exiled to the shadows. Now a couple of comedic panels are cut in the anime from the end of chapter 539 after Ichigo arrives in Nimaya's Hoden Zanpakdo forging cliff. In the manga, he complains about being thrown headfirst down the pipe by Nimaya. Now, the second half of episode 13 focuses entirely on Ichigo Zanpakuto being reforged, as it continues from chapter 540. When the Sword Five are introduced, we get some anime exclusive scenes where they start to reforge Ichigo Zanpakuto with his Asauchi. Now, in particular, there's a scene involving Nonomi that was not in the manga, which is added within the anime, as she kickstarts the entire reforging process. Now, all of the material involving Ichigo Ichigo's confrontation with Old Man Zangetsu is very faithful to the manga, and I have to admit that it's some of the best adapted material from the first cut of the anime. And I love how they had specifically shown the correct flashbacks that correlate to what Old Man Zangetsu was saying, like when his hollow had helped him throughout the series. The end credits begin to roll as Old Man Zangetsu explains how Ichigo will have his full power awakened, and he will now gain access to his true Zanpakuto. Chapter 542 is adapted into the end credits of episode 13, with crack flashbacks being shown in instances where Ichigo recalls Old Man Zangetsu and his inner hollow, and the instances where Old Man Zangetsu had intervened, lending Ichigo his latent Quincy powers. When Ichigo pulls out two of his new Zanpakuto and it evaporates all of the water, some comments from the Sword 5 and Nimaya are cut. The Sword 5 speak about never having seen anything like this happen before, as well as Nimaya explaining that the sea had dried up from Ichigo's immense spiritual pressure, as the water was used to cool down the soul of Ichigo's Zanpakuto. Now episode 13 wraps up with a brief post credit scene that's taken from the end of chapter 537, where Hashwal brings Udyu to Yuhobak, and we see Udyu in the Sternwitter clothing ready to fight alongside Yuhobak and the Quincy. So this brings us to the end of the first core of Bleach's Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. As we reach the end of chapter 542, with episode 1 having started by adapting material from chapter 480, which means that in total, the first part of the Thousand Year Blood War arc has adapted 62 chapters into 13 episodes. After the airing of episode 13, we had a surprise trailer drop which had announced Core 2 would begin airing in July of 2023, which is just 7 months away. The anime staff have promised there to be a 
lot of additional fight scenes, as well as more content involving Uryu's character being added, so it's definitely going to be a long and excruciating wait until July. What were your thoughts about the finale of the first car that adapts 9.5 chapters worth of content? Personally, I loved the script rewrites where Urahara was explaining holification, and I'd really enjoyed seeing the Blade Is Me portion being adapted so faithfully from the manga. So for now, this is going to be my last manga vs anime comparison video until July, so let me know what other videos you want me to make in order to fill the space between Core 1 and Core 2. I look forward to reading all of your comments on the finale of the first part of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, and lastly, thank you for making it to the end of this video, and I can't wait to see you in my next Bleach video. If you enjoy my content, then you can support my channel through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or even through YouTube by becoming a channel member. You will gain access to exclusive channel perks and a Discord server which I frequently use. So become a member of my Zero Division and be the first to know about my upcoming videos. And once again, thank you for sticking around till the end of the video, and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.